Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my girlfriend is furious that I decided to break up with her because she wanted an open relationship. I, 27 male, had been together with my girlfriend, 27 female, for three years. Stable relationship and no red flags from my point of view. Last Saturday, she asked for an open relationship. Her reasoning was that we did not get to enjoy ourselves in the past and it could help us strengthen the intimacy and love. I rejected it and she seemed unhappy after that. I'm not going to lie, an open relationship suggestion out of nowhere is a huge red flag for me and means probably there's someone else she has in mind already. I have been cheated on in the past and I made it very clear that I want a monogamous relationship before being exclusive. Her suggestion made me mental for a few days. I want to break up with her. I do love her, but she opened Pandora's box and I'm not sure if I can trust her in this relationship. It will not be healthy for both sides. Would I be the jerk if I leave the relationship without trying to salvage it? I tried saving my old relationship when there were trust issues and it did not work. I just don't want to harm my psychology struggling. At the same time, I doubt myself because I do love her and it's a three-year relationship. Update. I talked to her yesterday and I broke up with her. I told her I thought about her proposal and wanted to ask her a question. I basically asked why she was proposing going open relationship out of nowhere. She said she heard it from her friends and would like to try it to strengthen our relationship. I asked her if she had someone in mind already. She said no. I thanked her for her answers but stated I want a strictly monogamous relationship. Also, I told her how my trust for the relationship was shaken after her proposal and I want to break up with her. I wished her the best and prepared to leave the table. She got angry, a bit too angry with me. She called me insecure and called me every name possible in the book. I left the table quickly after hearing these and I went back home. She started calling me, texting me in an angry tone and I just had to block her. We both live with our families so breakup was quickly done. No need to take my belongings from the shared home or anything. There's no problem until here. Today, a friend told me she saw her with a male coworker the same night and asked me if I knew it. I told her we broke up yesterday, so yes, she definitely had someone in mind. It doesn't hurt as much as I thought it would. Maybe it's because I was ready for such a thing. Maybe my mentality changed after the last time I was cheated on. My mindset is all about moving on and not worrying about things that I can't control anymore. If she had been cheating during the relationship or not, I don't care to know. All I can do is move on and live my best life. I have a trip to South Korea this month and I want to enjoy it. Salvage what exactly? You wanted monogamy, expressed your wishes and she countered with an open relationship. Dude, there's nothing to salvage. You would not be the jerk for walking away. Open relationship suggestions like that out of the blue are usually, as you said, because they've found someone that they want to hook up with or because they've already cheated and they're trying to find a way to make it okay. She's talking straight BS about strengthening intimacy and love. Open relationships are a huge strain on both of those things. Regardless, time to move on. Don't fight for it. Just move on to someone you can trust. My wife tried the same crap on me. Now she's my ex-wife. She won primary custody because she's been a stay-at-home mom for 8 years while I work 60 hours a week and have to travel often. Now most of my salary goes towards paying her alimony and child support when the kids don't even want anything to do with me because she told them it was my fault we divorced, which technically I am the one who decided to divorce her when she gave me the ultimatum. It was either I be okay with other men being with my wife or I get out. I chose to get out. Her friends convinced her it was a good idea too. I'm full of regret, believing that my husband cheated on me when he didn't. Cheating is something that I've always had strong opinions about. I have been cheated on before and it sucked. Everyone knows that I don't forgive cheaters. So when my sister-in-law, my husband's sister, staged an elaborate scheme about my husband cheating, I ended the relationship. My relationship, unfortunately, wasn't the only one that was affected. My sister-in-law, Lisa, who's 32, her best friend, Emma, who's 32, and my husband, Jamie, 29, were best friends growing up. Emma got married early when she was 20. Her husband mistreated her. She has two kids with him. She got divorced 10 years later and she was finally free from his mistreatment. She suffered a lot, however, and was in therapy. Her and her kids. I, 30, met Jamie four years ago. We got married two years ago. Everything was just awesome. What I didn't know was that Emma wanted Jamie and Lisa to be together. She made it her mission. 
when Emma finally got divorced to bring her brother and best friend together. I didn't know any of this, so I never knew there was a hidden agenda when a few months into my marriage, I overheard Lisa talking about how Jamie was cheating with a married colleague of his. In hindsight, I can tell it was staged because she was saying unnecessary details and was being very loud. She meant for me to hear it. I confronted her then and there, and she played very flustered and apologized and begged me not to ruin my marriage. She told me Jamie loved me and she never wanted to lose me as a sister. But at the same time, she provided me with pictures and texts. They were all photoshopped of my husband and his colleague. She begged me not to mention where I had found out and I was grateful for her support and promised her not to expose her as the source. I confronted my husband with everything and he adamantly refused to admit to anything. It hurt me more that he never admitted nor apologized, ever. He asked me where I got this from, but I kept my promise and told him it was an anonymous tip. I also went so far that I contacted the colleague's husband. At the time, I thought it was the right thing to do. The colleague is this very beautiful woman that my husband worked very closely with for many hours a day. I was a bit jealous of that and I confided my fears with Lisa. She used it against me. I asked for divorce and the colleague's husband did too. After that, Lisa, who I thought was my friend, who called me her sister, disappeared from my life, like I never existed. Even when I bumped into her, she was short with me and indifferent. Months went by and I was still heartbroken, processing the separation. My husband stopped trying to make me see reason and agreed to divorce. He said he wanted to move on. I started having doubts. Why is Lisa doing this now? She was my friend and wanted the best for me, yet now she didn't even answer my texts. I followed both her and Emma on Insta and I started seeing how Emma and my husband gradually started hanging out. At least once a week, Emma or Lisa shared stories about my husband with Emma and her kids. What I did next is very questionable and yet I don't regret it at all. I was desperate and I needed the truth. I was still very good friends with Lisa's on-again, off-again boyfriend's, Mike's, sister. I told her my doubts and everything. I told her that Lisa was my source, that my husband was cheating and that I'm starting to doubt everything and that I needed their help to unearth the truth. Mike was easier to persuade to help me than I expected. He had Lisa's passcodes and he went through her messages with Emma. And there was everything. They had plotted everything. They used my idiocy and insecurity and made me throw the best thing that had ever happened to me away. He sent me all of the proof that I needed, even the original photos they used to Photoshop my husband with his colleague. My world was turned upside down again and I went deeper into depression. I stayed in bed, called in sick for two weeks. I've not only ruined my life, but also another family. I don't know why I'm writing here, if I want advice or just to vent. I don't blame anyone but my stupidity for ruining my marriage. I should have trusted my husband and the love that he's shown me. I should have been honest with him about everything and where I got the news that he was cheating from. I should have not gone to hurt the colleague and her family just because I thought her beautiful. She has since quit her job and moved, but I still had her husband's contact information. I had to at least apologize. We met and I told him everything. He was so angry with me. He was crying and yelling at me and all I could think was that I deserved every insult he threw my way. I found the colleague on Instagram and DM'd her everything and a long apology. She didn't answer me. I don't know if I should tell my husband too. I know I don't deserve him at all and I know that he doesn't want me anymore. But maybe he should just know that Emma is doing this and what she's capable of doing. He deserves to know the truth. Maybe I could start with reassuring him that I'm not trying to win him back. I'm just trying to help him understand and apologize. I need to apologize for everything. I don't know. Update. I decided not to meet up with Jamie. Every time I tried to text him and ask for a meeting, I panic. That wasn't a good sign at all. I wanted him to know everything in details and I tend to be all over the place when I'm panicking. So I decided to email him instead. I made a lot of drafts, crossed, checked all the information and waited a whole day before sending. Added some details here and there that I've forgotten to include. I sent him all of the manipulated pictures and the original. Every screenshot Mike sent me from Lisa and Emma's conversations. I made it clear, however, that I wasn't trying to manipulate him to have me back, because I knew that what I did was unforgivable, but that I wanted to warn him about who he's dealing with. I told him that I've been watching Emma and Lisa's Instagram, and I've seen that he was getting cozier with Emma. I wanted him to know all of the facts if he was dating her. This took all of my energy to write. Just the thought of him dating Emma, I mean, I can't. I texted him that I've sent him an important email. He didn't answer me. On Wednesday, when I came back from work, 
Lisa, Emma, and Emma's two kids were waiting for me outside of my building. When I let them in, stupid, stupid me, Lisa started yelling and threatening me. She told me to call and tell Jamie and Mike that I have made up all of this because I'm a pathetic loser. She told me I didn't want her as an enemy because she would make my life sour. Believe me, you don't want me to make destroying your already miserable life my mission. Emma just smiled the whole time. She later said that my husband always had a crush on her and that he wouldn't believe my nonsense because he could finally be with her. The thing is, it felt like Lisa was way more angry that Mike knew what she had done rather than her brother and she was really annoyed about Emma and told her to shut up a bunch of times. <laughs> I couldn't get them out of my apartment so I just left and called Jamie. I told him that they were at my place and that I couldn't get them out. 15 minutes later, I saw them leave. Jamie texted then that he wanted to come over if I was alright with it. Hashtag yes. <laughs> Hashtag really? He told me that he was very hurt that I would doubt him like this and believe the rumors. I told him everything, again, without panicking. I told him that I loved and trusted Lisa. She was like my sister and I asked him to put himself in my shoes and if he happened to hear Lisa talking about me being unfaithful. Would he have any doubts in his loving sister's intentions? He stayed the night and left the next morning. We've been texting several times a day and talking on the phone and FaceTime every night since. He says that he loves me, but that he doesn't know what to do. He's very hurt. By his sister and Emma, of course, but even by me. He hasn't talked about canceling the divorce process yet. I will just have to wait, and that's understandable. I've turned his life upside down twice in such a short period of time. On a happier note, my husband's colleague and her husband are back together. My husband met with them and apologized. I've already told them everything but my husband felt the need to apologize personally. Mike has ended it with Lisa. Lisa and Emma's relationship is very strained. Both have blocked me on Instagram, of course, but apparently Lisa is blaming Emma for Mike leaving her and Emma has tried to throw Lisa under the bus by telling Jamie she was innocent in all of this. I really hope my husband forgives me and I promise that I will make it up to him and love him. Hashtag forever. Am I the jerk for saying my stepmom can't take back how she treated me? I, 24 female, have always had a rocky relationship with my stepmom, Cindy, 51 female. She came into my life when I was 13, and pretty much as soon as she and my dad were married, she became very pushy about taking up a parental role. She came to all of my events and stuff, which I tried to appreciate, but she was very, it's my house too, and I get to make rules, after moving in with dad. She was the bad cop, I guess. She was the one who thought I didn't have enough chores, that my grades weren't good enough, that I needed screen time limits, etc. And that led to a lot of arguments. I hit the last straw at 17. The lawn needed cutting before Sunday. My dad said he'd do it Saturday afternoon, so I made plans to go hang out with my friends for the day. While I was out, Cindy messaged me saying I shouldn't have let dad do the lawn because he'd had a tiring week and that I should be doing it. Her usual MO basically. I said no and stayed out with my friends. When I got home, she was furious and tried to ground me and it turned into this big stupid argument where I pulled the you're not my mom card. Dad ended up stepping in. I wasn't grounded but also asked me to try and get along with her. It didn't matter because she decided she was done. She just kind of stopped acknowledging me. We basically became roommates who hated each other. I wasn't even allowed to eat food she bought. I'm not talking about special stuff. I mean like when the bread ran out and she was the one to replace it. It was all just really tense and I ended up spending a lot more time at my mom's apartment until I went to college. I've never formally blocked her or gone no contact but we just haven't spoken since. She never came anytime I met up with dad etc. Until me and my fiance announced our engagement. The wedding is over a year away but Cindy sent me a long text congratulating me and asking for all of the details so she could help plan it. She was asking about coming to dress fittings and if we wanted an engagement party and if she could make a speech at the wedding, basically asking about all of the mother of the bride stuff and pretending the last 11 years didn't happen. I didn't reply until dad reached out asking why I hadn't. I was honest with him. I'm weirded out by this. I'm happy for Cindy to come as his plus one, but she's not getting any role at the wedding. We're actually not even doing a head table just because I don't want to share a table with her or separate her from my dad because she's not my mom. And the last time I saw her, she was insistent about that. It's turned into a whole thing. He says she's really hurt and that he's rethinking coming to the wedding because she doesn't want to go. I say she can't take back what happened 
and at the very least, she should have apologized before reaching out like this. Mom and my partner are supportive of me, but I've had messages from several people on dad's side saying that I'm a jerk for punishing Cindy, and it's getting to me. So, am I the jerk? Just to clarify, because I've seen it brought up, mowing wasn't my job at home. It was a job for whoever was available, and my dad offered that time. A lot of what Cindy did was like that. Mom and dad didn't not parent me. I did have chores and a curfew and everything, but Cindy had a very you need to be doing more, you're not good enough, attitude right from the very start. It's hard to explain if you haven't experienced it, but I hope the lawn incident would detail it. It's the same for grades. I got encouragement to do better from my mom and dad. I was a solid B student to be honest, but Cindy was pushing for reduced screen time and privileges if I didn't get it up to an A. At this point, I think I'm at peace with my dad choosing her. I've seen people saying he's kind of a doormat and I think that's very accurate to be honest. I'm not going to raise a fuss if he doesn't come to the wedding, and anyone else who wants to know why can see this post. It's hard and it does hurt, but that's the way things are. I don't want any more drama. But if it keeps coming, at least I know it's not my fault thanks to you. The people on your dad's side, do they know the real reason? Or do they know Cindy's version of the truth where she's the victim? Not the jerk. She made her bed all those years ago, and it seems like your dad enabled her to do so. Now she has to lie in it. It's your wedding and she does not deserve a place in it, besides being your dad's plus one. If your dad chooses her and he doesn't come, then that's on him. Congrats on your upcoming wedding. Am I the jerk for not letting my children's father live with us? My ex-husband and I had three kids, who are 25, 23, and 22. We separated four years ago after he said he was tired of seeing my old face every day and wanted to find someone younger. His words to my face when asking for a divorce. The divorce was a mess, he tried in every way to take everything I had and I even had to take on half of his debt. Long story short, I never talked to him again face to face and we only talk through lawyers when it's something about our kids. Months ago, from my kids, I found out that he was diagnosed with cancer and it is in an advanced stage. I didn't say anything more about it because any topic related to him doesn't appeal to me, but I decided to support my kids and stay by their side. Yesterday, my three kids they all live with me, sat down with me, telling me that their father could no longer work, chemo plus cancer, and wouldn't be able to stay in his current home, so he had nowhere to live and they would like for him to live in the house in the last stages. I immediately said no and that I felt offended that I had even been asked that question knowing how much he and I dislike each other. They started to argue, saying that our house was his last option because his relatives couldn't and they didn't want to leave their father without a home and that I should think about them. I asked who would take care of him when things got worse, because all three of them work outside the home and I work from home, and who would cover all of his financial and medical expenses. They didn't know how to answer and that they would decide between the three of them to help their father and not be so burdensome for me, and that the three of them were willing to let their father live in our house. I said that despite valuing their opinion on any other matter in the house, this matter is my decision alone and it remains no. They called me heartless and don't think that they are just trying to give their father a place to live, not my ex-husband. And I was being petty about all of the things that he did and not thinking about them. They're still pressuring me to change my mind, especially with their father only having 15 more days in his house, but I can't feel anything other than offended that they've asked that knowing how much the divorce messes with depression and anxiety. My ex got in touch on my personal number, asking me to rethink and leave the past behind just in these last moments. Funny that he asked me, but not his exes much younger than me. Am I the jerk? If you want to know, the oldest is waiting for her own house to be ready and the two youngest are still unable to live alone and I don't care about the fact that they still live at home. Tell him he can ask his much younger and cuter exes. After all, you wouldn't want to bother him with your old face every day. Not the jerk. And do your kids know how he treated you? I understand not getting involved with my parents' grievances, but as a kid in that situation, I would never consider even asking my mother to care for my father if I knew how he had treated her. This would be my hill to die on. OP. They don't know that he talked about looking for new faces, but right after the divorce, he dated a woman 20 years younger, so there's no way not to connect the dots, and they know how bad I was. Depression, anxiety, low self-esteem. After the divorce, I spent 30 days in bed, almost doing nothing, and they had to force me to eat, so they know something. 
The guy I did homework for in high school reached out and now wants to buy me a house. I, 29 female, have always been good with numbers and responsible. It was more noticeable in school because no one gave a hoot. But given that I have cerebral palsy and walk with crutches, plus being a nerd, you can imagine I was an extremely easy target for bullying. One year they mixed us, so I had new classmates. The bullying was worse, but there was one of the popular guys who would defend me. At first I was confused, but when I saw that he would leave me his notebooks, I understood. And so began our symbiotic relationship. The bullying stopped and I would do his homework every day. We never talked about it and whenever he spoke to me, he sounded angry. It was like that for almost three years and his grades went up. I was just grateful I could be at peace in school. We graduated and never spoke again, nor did I see him again. But then a week ago, he reached out on Instagram. He told me how good life had been for him. He offered to buy me a house and a car. At first, I thought it was a scam, but we made video calls. He showed me things and it's legit. Long story short, he's a successful businessman worth millions living abroad. He said he always remembered me because I helped him get to where he is now. He said he wanted to repay me because he knew how hard it is to be disabled and a woman in my country specifically. He's not wrong, but I'm actually doing okay right now, so I declined all of his offers. But then I received a call from a medical center, the most expensive where I live, mind you, saying I had three years of physical therapy paid for. How he knew I did physical therapy, I don't know. I still thought it was a joke, so I went there and it was true. I already did my first two sessions and my body feels so much better. I'm still confused because I saw our relationship as purely transactional and now he comes and says he owes me. I'm confused. Edit. I already texted him so we can talk a little bit more about his offers because even though I turned them down, he said they'd still be up and hopefully I can have a hand on the wheel to choose some less crazy expensive options. Thank you again. I feel less guilty now. You did his homework for three years and he paid for three years of therapy. It sounds like he knows exactly what he's doing and he wants to say thank you now. Remember that for the really wealthy, something that seems crazy generous to us is the monetary equivalent of buying you lunch. Enjoy your therapy and may it continue to bring you relief. That's a nice gesture. You should take it and be thankful. Don't turn down on someone who is trying to be kind, seemingly with not ill intent. I had a friend offer to do something nice for me and I declined. His response changed my point of view forever. He said, you don't get to decide whether or not I get to do things for people that make me happy. And I realized it wasn't just for me, it made him happy and feel like he's making the world a better place. This is disgusting. If you're the person he's doing the thing for, you very much do get to decide whether he does it. It's not appropriate to force something on somebody that they don't want to make yourself happy. Only on this website would multiple people get upset about someone being adamant about being kind and generous. Better get enthusiastic consent before I hold a door open for someone. Disgusting? Y'all are weird. Am I the jerk for not being grateful when my wife buys gifts for me that are actually for her? A few years back, my wife got me a hammock for my birthday, despite me having never expressed the slightest interest in a hammock and despite her wanting one. Whatever, I think okay, weird. She just totally misread what I like. A year later, she buys me a lawnmower for my birthday, something I would never in a million years want for my birthday, but was simply a household item we needed. I was annoyed. I likened it to me buying her a dishwasher for her birthday. This year, we have a new car. She's very much wanted seat covers for it. I very clearly articulated that I don't think we need them. They're a waste of money, don't want them, etc. My birthday comes around and my birthday gift is seat covers for the car. Am I the jerk? I feel annoyed, frustrated, and disrespected. But if I try to voice that, I know I will be guilt-tripped into thinking otherwise. I honestly don't know what's true anymore. Edit. Many of you have asked what I've bought her over the years. One year, I bought her a kayak trip. She loves experiences as much or more than things, along with large printed art pieces from the night we got engaged. Another year, I bought her a custom-made hoodie. She's always cold, with her favorite animal on it. Another year, I bought her a necklace with interchangeable moon pendants. She's obsessed with the moon, with each pendant being the phase of the moon on our first date, on the date we got engaged, and on our wedding date. Another year, I got her a framed image from our wedding. She had said she wanted more pictures of us, and baked her a cake. That year, she never came home that night, 
because she was out getting drunk with friends, which I admit really hurt. This year, I got her one of those star-slash-galaxy projectors that displays stars and the northern lights across the ceiling and walls because she's always talked about wanting to see the northern lights and likes to lay in bed to relax in the evenings before going to sleep. Not the jerk. She is clearly thinking she knows better than you what you need and want. As another poster here suggested, just start buying her gifts that you want. While it may seem childish, it's probably the only way she will understand what she's doing and how it makes you feel. You could also return the car seats and go buy yourself something you actually want. Or get a divorce if that's possible, and she refused couple therapy. I didn't design your shirts, Karen. Tale from years ago, when I worked for a consulting firm. Sorry if the details are a little fuzzy, this was a long time ago. I'm also long-winded and sleep-deprived, so it's a rambling one. The office layout on my floor had four private offices that were for four different independent contractors. One specialized in graphic design, one in copywriting, one in media sales, and one in advertising campaigns. All of the assistants for these different specialists sat in one large room out front at our tiny desks. Each of us worked for only one of the consultants, but were happy to pass on basic information to the other ones. We, however, had no contact info or calendar access for anyone else's boss. I was sitting at my desk doing some SEO work when Karen flung open the front door. Violently enough, it actually banged against the wall. I was the closest to the door, so I jumped and looked over. Karen took this as a cue to storm over to my desk and throw down a CD. Did you people make this? She snarled. I picked up the CD and looked at her. No idea what she's talking about. Um, was my brilliant reply. Did you people make this? Oh, good. Volume was the only reason I didn't know what you were talking about. Thanks, Karen. Karen snatches the CD back from me. We had these t-shirts designed by the graphic designer, and he gave us these files, and the printer said they're all messed up. He ripped us off. Me. Oh, so graphic designer dude made this for you. Well, he's not here right now. Karen launches into a loud tirade, questioning my ability, my education, my personal attractiveness, and parentage, which, yeah, aren't the best, but that has nothing to do with her stupid t-shirts. I finally pull out my mom slash librarian voice. I am neither, but you know the voice I mean. Me. Ma'am. Ma'am. Surprising us both, Karen stopped talking. Me. Ma'am, I do not work for graphic dude. Best I can do is give you a pen and paper to write him a note. But if you worked with him, you should have his email or phone. Email is the best way to get in touch with him. Karen. When will he be back in the office? Me. No idea. I don't work for him. You'd best call or email him or leave a note. Karen. Well, go in his office and check his calendar and tell me where he is. Me. No, couldn't even if I wanted to. His office is shut and locked. Well, unlock it. I don't have a key. We just work in the same building. Call him and tell him I'm here and I need to speak with him. Me. No, I don't have his number and I'm not his secretary. Not really true. I have his number, but heck no, I'm not playing receptionist. Karen. I spend a ton of money with you and I demand, ma'am. You do not spend a ton of money with me. I don't work for graphic dude. Yeah, yeah. You don't do the computer stuff. You're just the secretary. Now, get him on the phone. I took a second to figure out how me sitting in front of the computer and using it when she came in equals not doing the computer stuff, or how secretary equals no computers, but this wasn't the brightest tool in the box, and she was giving me a headache. So I went to my boss and asked her to dislodge the Karen Barnacle from my life. My boss. Ma'am, I'd be happy to give a message to the graphic guy where is he? My boss. I don't know. You can leave a message. Are you the manager? My boss. Yes. She's a consultant. She is self-employed by her own company, so I guess she is her own manager. Technically mine too, but neither of us were sure what Karen was going for here. Well, I want to speak to the owner. My boss. Owner of what exactly? Karen turns and points to me. I kid you not, this woman snarls. That girl there. My boss and I are sharing a look. My boss says to Karen very slowly, You want to speak to her owner? Karen nods emphatically. I want her fired. 
Other guy in the office pipes up. Don't you mean disowned? My boss glares at him. My boss. Ma'am, I am her boss and I'm not firing her. And we have nothing to do with Graphic Dude. We can't help you. Please leave and try to get in touch with him on your own. More shrieking. Karen is now questioning both my and my boss's work ethic, personal grooming, and voting preference. My best guess is she got herself all worked up into a righteous indignation rage at the t-shirt issue before she came in, and she just transferred all that ire to me because I opposed her will. But her anger at me for not working for Graphic Dude is way out of proportion. Graphic Dude's assistant has walked into the office during all of this, and being the accommodating soul he is, offers to look at the file. Karen stomps over and hands it to him, while he explains that Graphic Dude is out of town at a wedding and won't be back until Tuesday. Graphic Dude, by the way, does not do any work outside the office, which upsets Karen more. The file opens up for Graphic Dude's assistant dude. It's some hideous summer family reunion t-shirt. Other dude looks at Karen. So, what's wrong with it? Karen scowls. The screen printer said the file is all messed up. Graphic Dude's assistant dude looks confused. It's fine. No, it's not, she shrieks. Now the other guy is trying to explain that the file is fine, but she can get in touch with Graphic Dude next week. Not good enough for Karen. She keeps yelling while Assistant Dude looks at the image more closely. Assistant Dude. Oh, are you Miss Karen McJerkface? Yes, Assistant Dude. Oh, okay, I can fix this for you. Karen smiled broadly, praises him in a sickeningly sweet, good puppy manner, and saunters over to us to explain how she's still going to get us all fired and it's about time, blah, blah, blah. Assistant dude comes over and hands her a new disc and sends her on her merry way. My boss goes back to her office and shuts the door, telling me not to come get her if that harpy ever comes back in. I look at assistant dude who's grinning. Assistant dude is a college sophomore, graphic dude grossly underpays to gain experience, and he gives no darns. So I know something is up. Me. Okay, assistant dude, what did you do? Assistant dude. Come take a look. On his computer is the image Karen wanted on her t-shirts, open from the disc she brought in. Comic Sans, McJerk Family Reunion 2020, with a dumb picture. Okay, assistant dude. And here's what I just saved on a new disc for her, and shows me the same image where he has replaced the text with, jerk pay me. Assistant dude is smiling. I remembered her name finally, he said. Graphic dude was upset. She sold him this sob story about why she couldn't pay half up front like we normally do, and he made an exception. Then, once she had the files, she refused to pay for it. Originally, we were going to get the shirts printed for her, but she stiffed us and took the file and ran. She figured she could just get them printed herself. I told Graphic Dude not to give her a print-ready file for approval, but he thought since we were going to handle the shirt order, yeah. I get it now. She likely went to the cheap local screen print shop that I happen to know doesn't have anywhere close to the latest version of any graphic programs. This comes up a lot in this office. If a customer uses that shop, the shop guy will try to open a file saved from the latest version of graphic software and go, can't open it, go get it saved as an earlier version and sends customers back. This Karen wasn't bright enough to remember anything past, file no work, you bad. And of course, you are all probably quicker than me and realize what took a minute to dawn on me. Karen gave assistant dude her disc. He saved the new image on a new disc and gave it to her. She left the original file in our office, so unless she was smart enough to make a copy, she now no longer has the file she stiffed graphic design dude on. I'm sad to say that she never came back in. I hate a story with no follow-up, but such is life. Myself, I hope she gets the shirts printed without anyone catching the file change. I brought assistant dude some banana bread I baked the next day to thank him for his efforts. Speaking of graphic design, have you or anybody you know ever done graphic design? I think that stuff is so cool. Please let me know. Residents tried to kick out the owner, got their houses demolished. This is a case that a lawyer friend of mine told me about. There was once a builder who wanted to develop the land he owned, so he built a small apartment complex. Nothing too fancy, just six large flats. Five flats were sold for a tidy sum and the builder made quite a profit. He intended to keep the sixth flat on the top for himself as it was in a nice neighborhood. For some reason or another, one of the five residents didn't really like this arrangement at all. 
so he decided to do something to get that builder evicted. He spoke to his new neighbors-to-be and got them all on his side. A relative of his was a criminal lawyer. He shall be called Idiot Lawyer. So he conspired to report the top apartment to the civic authorities as having violated municipal codes and whatnot with the intention of getting that top floor demolished. Naturally, the builder was not happy with this. He was basically blindsided with the petition and the case put up against him. Not only could he not build the top floor, but he had to pay the other residents damages. That's where my friend comes into the picture. Now the one thing you should know about the city I live in was that it's kind of an open secret that every single building in the city violates some code or the other. It is to the point that the municipal corporation adopts an unofficial don't ask, don't tell policy. As long as you keep your mouth shut and maybe grease a few palms, they look the other way. As long as that building isn't visibly dangerous or liable to fall. The other side strategy was to get the builder to agree to stop construction of the top floor to avoid having to pay a fine and go through a lengthy court battle. They weren't expecting the builder to appeal the municipal corporation's decision. See, while the body adopts a don't ask, don't tell policy unofficially, the moment things become official, they are more than willing to come down like a ton of bricks on violators the moment an appeal got filed. Instead of just the top construction, the entire building got slated for demolition. Naturally, the builder, with the help from lawyer friend, was appropriately apologetic towards the body and offered to do the demolition himself in exchange for a waiver of the fine. The court was more than happy to oblige. After all, it saves them money and resources. As the builder owned those machines, the cost to him was reduced. It did eat into the profit he made, but he still had a lot of money remaining. As for the residents, well, they really should have done their homework. I'm not too sure of the technicalities, but between the contract they signed with the builder when buying the apartments and the law as it was written, lawyer friend ensured that there was no way that they were going to get their money back at all. So they were out of pocket and out of a house. Apparently, according to lawyer friend, idiot lawyer's face when he was told this was priceless. He tried settling out of court, but lawyer friend said he openly laughed in his face in response. I guess you don't bring a criminal lawyer to a land dispute. My brother deleted my siege account. I got revenge. Okay, context time. I, 17 male, live with my parents and brother, who's 13. We had gotten a PS4 a few Christmases ago. My brother had downloaded Fortnite on it and was mad addicted. He even went to desperate measures as to sneaking the controller out of our parents' room during the day slash night. Now, story time. Sometimes I would go into my brother's room, see him on the PS4 and ask, do mom and dad know you're on that? His response, what's it matter to you? I'd tell him, I just want to make sure you asked first. He'd tell me, just go away and quit being nosy. This went on for several months. I didn't think it would be so bad until one day while he was at school, I decided to hop onto Spider-Man for PS4. Great game by the way. I had discovered food wrappers in his drawers, shelves, you name it. I decided to confront him about it when he got home. Convo goes as follows. Me. Hey, little brother, did you want to explain something to me? Little brother. Not now. I'm going to hop on Fortnite. Me. Do you want to tell me why I found food wrappers in your shelves? Brother got defensive. Why did you look through my stuff? Mind your business. Me. You do know that we aren't allowed to eat in our rooms, right? I can do whatever I want. Eat in here and sneak the controller out. And you can't say anything about it. Me. Whatever, dude. Then what he said took action in my brain. I really could say something about it. However, I would need proof of this deal. That caused me to grind some gears and get to work. While he was at school, I decided to take pictures of the food wrappers, hidden controller, and a few other things. I compiled them into a file on my gallery and waited for the right moment. Unfortunately, waiting was my downfall. I later found out my brother had got the password for my phone and deleted that file. I was livid at the fact. I had gotten on the PlayStation and played some Apex Legends. My brother came home, demanding I get off so he could play. He told me about how he's going to continue this act and how he got the password for my phone and deleted my evidence file. I said forget it and got off. One day, I tried to log into my account on Rainbow Six Siege, but it said my account was non-existent. I tried several times, but no luck. Later, I found out my brother hopped onto my Siege account and deleted it. I confronted him about it when he came home and he smiled and said, Maybe I wouldn't have to do that if you didn't try to bust me. Never have I been so angry, hopeless, and sad. 
years of progress, gone. All those operators, skins, attachments, everything, gone. I felt defeated, but then a moment of hope shined. My mom asked me to see if I could find my brother's Bible, as she wanted to see if it was still intact. My plan B was going to take place. Basically, instead of actually looking for the Bible, I stood in the room for about 20 minutes and made some racket to make it sound like I was looking for it. After the 20 minutes, I yelled for mom. Hey, I can't find it. Could you help me? Why I did that? Let me explain. Instead of getting evidence of my brother's shenanigans, I would have mom help me look, but instead have her find everything. When looking, she found one food wrapper and she asked, do you know where this came from? To which I replied, not a clue. This leads her to find the following items hidden. Three Pringles cans, five empty sodas, some Ritz cracker packages, an entire box of Andis mints, and some other stuff. She also found where my brother hid the controller. She was so livid she could barely contain herself. She confronted brother about it and this was her punishment to him. She unplugged both the TV and PS4 cord so he couldn't get on, hid the controllers, we had three of them, in her closet, then locked it with the only key and took away his tablet. Instead of going to see a movie, I think it was Sonic, with some family friends and going to their house afterwards, he had to stay home with my dad and clean up his own room. A few days later, he tried to scold me. Conversation goes as follows. Little brother. I hope you're happy with yourself. Me. What do you mean? I can't play Fortnite anymore, and it's your fault. Me. Actually, it's your fault. You tried to shove me away when I confronted you, but you still continued your act. Mom busted you, and now your privileges are gone. Little brother. I'm gonna make sure you suffer for this. Me. Good luck. Also, mom talked about putting the PS4 in my room. Thought I might let you know. What? But that's not fair. Nothing is fair when you get busted. You will give me the PlayStation back or I'll steal it from your room. Me. Try it. I'm sure my audio recording will tell mom your motives. He finally gave up and stormed off. He's gonna kiss Fortnite goodbye for a while. Never have I been so satisfied. Speaking of video games, what's the name of the last video game you've played? Please let me know right now. Grandmother decided that our family Christmas needed drama. My story takes place way back in the 90s. I'm just out of vocational school, embarking on the years of servitude required to get one's electrician's license, working for a small mom and pop electrical contractor. Now, having a trade-based job and being an apprentice, I was laid off in the beginning of December, not fired, not told not to come back. In fact, I was the last apprentice to be laid off for the winter. Now I collect unemployment, work side jobs, help my parents with chores. Basically, I'm neither a mooch or a burden. This will be important later. Christmas Day, family, food, love, well, mostly. You see, we are hosting the dinner. Now really, my family is great. All but this one grandmother, maternal grandmother. Entitled grandmother despises me. Why? Well, Sunday school wasn't my thing. I love Dungeons and Dragons. I'm always listening to Ozzy. I was by her definition, not a good Christian boy. But to help establish her entitlement anytime there was an electrical issue, I was called because family help family and never expects to receive money for their efforts. But if you need her help, it was always an inconvenience. Now, two weeks prior to Christmas Day, I just spent a week running new circuits for outdoor plugs so we could decorate for Christmas and redo some old wiring in the basement. Now, I received no payment for my labor, no lunch, not even a thank you. I almost had to pay for materials because it was expected that I had them because I was an electrician, but Grandpa balked at that and bought the materials. I'll keep the cast down to just those involved. There will be me and my entitled grandmother. So Christmas Day dinner, everyone seated at the table. Entitled grandmother forces everyone to say grace. We are not deeply religious and food's being passed around. I've placed myself strategically so that if somebody needs something, I can get up and get it leaving everyone else to just enjoy dinner. To this point, the requests have been things like, Hey OP, mind getting another napkin please? Or, OP, can I please have a glass of white wine? Typical things, until... Entitled Grandmother. Boy, this roll is cold. Heat this now. The table grows a bit quiet, as I take the roll and figure I'll give it five minutes in the oven. Entitled Grandmother shouts from the table, I want the roll warmed, and put butter on the roll and milk that, and then honey put over the melted butter, and what's taking so long? I put butter and honey on it, but I toss it in the microwave. Ding, hot rubber roll. 
entitled Grandmother. No, no, no. I want it oven warmed. It's too chewy now. Me. Nope, you wanted it fast. Didn't have the decency to ask, so here you go. Entitled Grandmother. You got some nerve. Lazy, unemployed louse. Burdening us with your situation at Christmas. Me. Try asking me instead of demanding. Unless you rather I get a uniform and a little white towel over my forearm. That suffice, Miss Daisy? Entitled Grandmother. Rude boy. So ungrateful. No wonder you can't hold a job. Easy to burden us. If that's the way you act on your job, no wonder you got fired for being lazy. I lock my eyes onto her and the table is completely silent. Me. It's winter. Not many houses being built. Economy kind of shaky, especially for trade jobs. I wasn't fired. I make money doing side jobs till I'm picked up again in February. Entitled Grandmother. You made me wait two days to start work on my house. Two days. You're lazy, and that's why you're fired. Told everyone you got fired for being a layabout. Undependable, ungrateful. Go on, take from us. We work hard to put food on the Christmas table. She didn't work. Look at all this food we have provided, and you contributed nothing. She brought nothing but her delightful self, and I helped to cook all the food. Look at your expensive presents. From mom and dad, not from her. And you dare to not serve me a single warm roll at my request? You ruined my Christmas. You ruined everyone's Christmas. It's at this point my fist came down on the table. I hit the fork on my plate, spraying my entitled grandmother with potatoes, corn, gravy, and crumbs. I left the table, got my coat, and headed out. Headed to a friend's house, got a group together, drank eggnog, and played Dungeons and Dragons. First Christmas without my family and still a good Christmas. It wouldn't be till the next day that I would return home and hear the aftermath. My entitled grandmother on my exit from the house demanded I pay for her clothes. I didn't, and told everyone at the table that she was the only one brave enough to say what everyone was thinking about me. My dad said that if we're going to say what we are thinking, he's going to continue. Dad told her she was the poorest excuse for a grandmother there ever was, that this wasn't her Christmas, she was a guest at his house, and then dropped the not a very good Christian display on Christmas Day. My mother went off about how I spent the time working her house for outdoor lights with no pay in the cold, and that I waited two days to help around my parents' place fixing a few things. My paternal grandmother ripped into my entitled grandmother, saying that entitled grandmother wasn't half the mother that she was, and not even a quarter of the grandmother, and the gall to be so entitled that she could say what everyone was thinking when no one was thinking that. Everyone piled on her. Her only counter was to exclaim, Well, I never, at each truth that came out. That would be the last joint Christmas we would have. My parents would go to the Entitled One's house for Christmas Eve dinner. She would have her church friends over. I would spend the evening with my girlfriend at the time. Christmas Day was at my parents' house, but just had my father's parents and my mom's sister over. She just wanted to know where the electric blankets were. This happened to me this weekend. I work at a big box store and was covering the home goods department since someone called out. Side note, it's not my normal department. I normally work in either kitchenware or the seasonal section, but I have worked in this section enough to know what we do and don't have and where stuff is. Anyway, I was stocking a shelf when this older woman comes up to me. For this story, we're going to call her Old Hag. She steps a little too close to me. Karen. Excuse me? Her breath was awful. I noticed she had plastic food prep gloves on her hands as I took a step back, plastering a smile on my face. Me. Hi, what can I do for you? Where are your electric blankets? I'm sorry ma'am, we're sold out of them. How do you know that? I saw them go on clearance about two months ago and haven't seen them since. Okay, can you get me someone who actually works in this department? Clearly you don't know what you have. I was stunned. I've never had a customer say this to me before. Me. Well, ma'am, I'm in this department today, so I work in this section. Like I said, I know we are out of electric blankets in this section, but you could try the camping section and sporting goods. There's a chance it would be over there. Karen. What would an electric blanket be doing in the camping section? Me. I'm not sure. I know there are air mattresses over there, and I thought I saw some over there before. So there's a chance there could be... So you ought to tell me that you actually have electric blankets? Why would you lie? I just stared at her, not sure what to say. Are you stupid? Can you understand me? I let out a small laugh. I've never had a customer be this rude to me. 
and for some reason found this situation absurd and somewhat hilarious. Me. Look, ma'am, like I said earlier, we are out of electric blankets. If the store has any, they might be in camping. If they are not there, we are completely sold out. It was the old hag's turn to stare at me. What's your name? Me. Crown of Roses. Okay, Crown of Roses. You know why I asked you that? You don't have your name badge on, and you've been very rude to me. I'm going to report you. And with that, she stormed off. I promptly called my manager and informed him what happened. He said not to worry about it and thanked me for letting him know. 30 minutes later, my coworker, we'll call her Amy, who works at guest service, comes up to me and recounts her experience with Karen. Apparently, she was mad I had sent her to the camping section and called me a moron to Amy. Amy apologized for what happened and offered to look up if we had any electric blankets at other stores. She grabbed a device to pull up the information. Side note, it's basically a glorified smartphone. Karen didn't like this one bit. Why are you looking that up on your phone? You should know what other stores have. You look really stupid doing that. Amy, I'm sorry ma'am, but since it's February, there's a chance they could be sold out in other stores, so I'm seeing which ones have it. Unfortunately, the closest store that had it was 15 miles away. Amy informed Karen of that, but she was having none of it. Amy, I'm sorry ma'am, that we are out of it. You might want to try a different store. But how am I supposed to exchange my electric blanket if I go to a different store? Amy told me that was the first time she had heard the lady mention an exchange, but with the patience of a saint, she played along. Amy, oh, you have an exchange? That is unfortunate we are out of electric blankets, but we could give you a refund for it instead. Karen, but what would I do with a refund? All I want is an exchange. How hard is it for you people to understand that? You and that other girl are morons. Y'all have no idea how to treat customers. What is your name? Amy said she had pointed to her name badge and said her name. You've been rude to me, Amy. I'm going to report you and that moron that sent me to camping. Who's your store manager? I want his number. Amy. Well, he's actually still here if you want to talk to him. I can call him up. That's not what I asked. I want his name and his number so I can call him and report y'all. Amy proceeded to give her our store manager's business card, which she later recounts Karen snatching from her and storming off. Amy and I had a good laugh over the situation as we both wondered what had set this woman off to be so rude to us. Thankfully, the store manager and our respective department managers took our sides, and we have nothing to worry about. Plow my driveway for free. In college, I sort of accidentally got into the snow removal business around my neighborhood since I had a weird class schedule that gave me a lot of free time in the mornings and not a lot of homework. I had purchased a small John Deere compact trailer as a project to tinker with in my garage in my spare time. I got it for next to nothing since the previous owner knew nothing about it and considered it to be just a stupid lawnmower and just wanted it out of his yard. Well, this thing was definitely not a lawnmower. This was a proper tractor with hydraulics and everything just shrunk down to about the size of a Mini Cooper. The kind of thing a homeowner would use for basic maintenance work around their property that requires something a little beefier than a riding lawnmower, but not quite a full-blown farm tractor. It was about 30 years old when I bought it, having been built sometime in the 80s, but ran perfectly, and since the guy threw in a snowblower attachment with it, I figured I could make a little extra cash clearing driveways in the morning before class. I had to fix a few things and added a spot to carry a shovel for the spots I couldn't get with the blower, and I was all set. Well, after the first major snowfall and just going around offering my services to neighbors, I had about 20 driveways that I would do and got the money I paid for the tractor, which admittedly wasn't much, back pretty much immediately. I wasn't charging a whole lot since I was just some kid, not a professional snow plow contractor, but most people on my street were elderly and very grateful for my service and tipped me pretty heavily. There were a few people that actually seemed to enjoy shoveling their own driveway or had their own snowblower who didn't pay me to do it regularly, but they would ask me occasionally to do it as a one-time thing if the snow was super deep or they just didn't have time. One lady who lived three houses down from me, however, had pretty much adamantly refused my help at the beginning of the season and almost seemed offended that I thought she was incapable of shoveling her own driveway. By the way, this woman was probably 26 at most and had like seven or eight kids. She even had her own bus, 
which was a converted Ford Econoline van that she used to transport them all around in. I guess her only hobby was passionate hugging. I figured with all those kids taking up her time, she would be thrilled to have someone look after her driveway, but I guess not. February rolls around, and while my roommate, still jealous of her by the way, was on vacation down south somewhere we got absolutely hammered with snow. Like, I'm talking a foot and a half to two feet overnight, every night. I had to get up extra early each morning just to get everything done before I had to go to class around noon. I always just cleared a single path out of our driveway so my roommates could walk to class and I could get the tractor out. But I never fully cleared our own driveway till last. My roommates didn't have cars and it wasn't like I was taking my truck anywhere if I was out blowing snow. One day, I get finished with my customer's driveways and come home to finish cleaning up our driveway when passionate hugging, obsessed lady comes over waving her arms around at me. Since that's pretty long to type each time, we'll just call her Entitled Mom. Entitled Mom. Excuse me? Me, shutting off the engine so I can hear her. Yes, what's up? Would you mind plowing my driveway? There's been so much snow this week, I just haven't been able to keep on top of shoveling it. Me. I don't have time to do a full cleanup, as I have to go to class soon, but I can get it opened up enough that you can get out, and I'll come back after class and get the rest if you want. This is how much I usually charge, but since I don't have time to do a proper job this morning, I'll do it for half price. You're joking, right? How can you take advantage of a single mom like this? If I could afford to pay someone to plow my driveway, I would. You disgust me. I asked you to do me a favor as a neighbor, but you have to try and make a quick buck off of everything. I can't believe you're this lazy that you'd buy a machine like this to plow your small driveway and won't even help your neighbors out. Your generation is hopeless. Bear in mind, this woman is no more than five years older than me. Pretty sure she's still part of my generation. Me. You're right, it is overkill for my driveway. That's why I have about 20 people in the neighborhood paying me to do theirs as well. This is kind of a business for me to make some extra cash while I'm in school. And if everyone else is paying me, why should I do yours for free? I bet your mommy and daddy pay for all your schooling anyway. You don't need the money. She's not wrong. My parents busted their butts and saved up probably three times as much as what was necessary to put me through school, to which I am forever grateful for. But that doesn't mean I don't have other living expenses I need to pay for. Me. So what if they did? Diesel fuel for this thing isn't free, and I'm just asking for enough to cover that and some compensation for my time, which is pretty much how any other business operates. I don't think it's unreasonable of me to charge for my services. Your parents probably pay for that too. Wait till they realize what a brat you are and cut you off financially. Then you'll see what life is all about. This really rubbed me the wrong way because my parents have paid for a lot of stuff in my life, which again, I'm very grateful for. But since they were helping me pay off my truck while I was in school, I didn't really feel like I owned it yet. I know it sounds silly, but that tractor was the first major thing I ever bought entirely with my own money without my parents' help, and I was very proud of it because of that. I was done dealing with her at this point and just went back to work cleaning up my own driveway and then went to class. Unfortunately, I have to walk past our house going to and from school, so on my way back, I walk past our house and her bus is stuck real bad in the driveway. Like, it has gotten stuck and then slid sideways partly onto her front lawn. She's outside trying to dig out the back wheels, and when she sees me, she explodes. I couldn't get my kids to daycare because of you and missed work because of it. It was 11.20 when I talked to her that morning. Who doesn't have their kids in daycare already by that point? Also, people are usually at work by then too. I just ignored her and went inside. For the next few days, it continued to snow relentlessly and I continued making an absolute fortune, by college student standards, off of the storm. It was so bad some days, I had to go back out after class and clear the driveways again. Everyone was more than happy to pay and tip me both times and one old lady even made me a thermos full of hot chocolate to keep me warm. My tractor didn't have a cab, obviously. With the extra people who usually did it themselves also calling me and asking me to bail them out on top of my usual route, I was doing pretty well. Every time I'd come home, I'd always see Entitled Mom trying, unsuccessfully, to dig herself out 
but she just couldn't deal with that heavy wet snow the city plows would push onto her driveway from the road on her own. I felt bad for her, but whatever. If she was going to be rude to me, it was not my problem. Eventually, she flagged me down one day and tells me that she'll give me whatever I want if I'll just please come over and dig her out. Apparently, her work was threatening to fire her if she kept calling in because of the snow and not being able to get her kids to daycare. I did it for her and she paid. No tip, which is understandable with her situation, but did apologize to me for being so rude and now understood the value behind what I was doing. She still took care of the snow on her own most of the time after that, but she did ask me to help her out on occasion when it got really bad, which I did get paid for. I never had any issues with her after that, and I think she's learned her lesson. Speaking of snow, do you love snow or can you not stand it? Please let me know. Customer hands me bad check while trying to return used shoes. The original ordeal happened last week, and he came back yesterday to try his hand at giving us bad checks again yesterday. So I think it's time I post this story. Cast. We've got me. We've got the bad man. We've got Kay, my coworker who works at both of our store's locations. Oh boy, here we go. I was at the front running the register when this guy walks in. He starts asking me if we had these shoes here. He wasn't holding a box and the counter covered his feet. So I lean over and see he's talking about the shoes he's wearing. I'm like, oh yeah, they're on clearance now though, so I don't know how many we have left. Then he starts talking about how they're the wrong size and how he wants to exchange them for a different size. I'm stunned that he wants to give me the hot and sweaty shoes he's wearing in exchange for a fresh pair in my store. And so I tell him I'm going to need the receipt and the original box in order to do that. Of course, he has neither. If you have a return for a clothing item, especially shoes, you don't wear it out on the town and then come strolling in with it on your body looking to get a new one in exchange for your old sweaty ones. Our return policy is about to change, so I was done with this type of return fraud. Knowing that I have no intention of accepting this return without the vital components, he goes around the store shopping. When he comes up to check out, he's holding some shorts, shoes, different than the ones he originally wanted, and a reel that he had my coworker spool up for him. And so we begin checking out, in which I ask if he's a member. He says he is, so I attempt trying his name and phone number, yet nothing comes up. He's already starting to get weird by now saying that the girl from yesterday must have intentionally mistyped his information to make him look bad. I was the only girl here the day before, so no sir, I didn't do that. So we skip it because he's starting to make me uncomfortable and I just wanted him out. The customer behind him is watching intently, looking taken back by this guy's odd requests and attitude. It's time to pay and he pulls out what appears to be a checkbook. He asks for a pen and I give it to him and when he's done he hands it to me and asks if we accept business checks. I'm looking at it and ask if this is supposed to be tax exempt. He gets all jumpy and says, yeah. But before I can ask anything else, he's like, wait, let me go get my other checks and try to find the receipt for the shoes. So he quickly goes out the door and I take the next customer on the other side. This other customer is in disbelief still, wondering what this guy's deal is. He heard the thing about wanting to return the shoes that are on his feet and is laughing about how disgusting that is and how he hopes I wouldn't take them back. We have a good laugh and when he leaves, bad man is walking back through the doors. He's holding a checkbook that still doesn't look right and asks for a pin again. This check is pre-typed and he starts changing the number one to four with a pin. When he hands it to me, I'm looking at it in awe, wondering what I'm looking at. The name doesn't match, the date is wrong, Routing numbers are going sideways, it isn't made out to our business, and this man changed the type amount to a different amount with a pin on top of the original amount. He also wrote his license number on the top and something else, but it doesn't matter because the whole check was trashed. He starts saying, oh yeah, that's my wife's name, and I wrote the license number so you know it's legit. And I'm just like, um, let me get the assistant manager up here. She comes up and by taking one look at it, she's like, no sir, we are not taking this. He starts arguing with her, asking what's wrong with it. The money comes out of the account automatically, so just take it, which it absolutely does not. And is like, well, I did this yesterday. He didn't. She keeps refusing, so he leaves in a huff, still yelling as he's walking out the door. He left everything behind, even the reel we spooled with his choice of line. A few days later, 
all is going well until one of the cashiers calls me up to help him with a check. I was right around the corner, and upon coming closer, it's the bad man, and I say, oh, hello again, which he clearly didn't like. He was already jumpy about our younger cashier not just accepting it, and now when he sees me walk up, he didn't even acknowledge me because he knew what he was trying to do again. So I start looking at it, and I'm like, hmm, gonna need to get another manager. The other manager and me have the same title and powers, but I wanted backup because I didn't know how this guy was going to react when he got denied for a second time. I quickly brief him and we walk up together. My manager takes one look at it and is like, no, sorry, we can't accept this. The guy starts pitching the same fit, like, you haven't even tried to run it, just run it and see what happens, but my manager isn't budging. One thing I love about him is he is not a pushover, no matter how aggressive someone gets. He finally says, Sir, I'm going to say this for the last time. We will not be accepting this check. And he just stands there, holding the check for Badman to take back. Badman storms out again, like he can't believe we aren't going to take poorly done bad checks. This is the last we have heard from him, but that only happened yesterday, so I'm expecting this guy to come back and try it on a different set of my coworkers. I'm just glad I won't have to waste my time calling the check clearing company since we all know now it's a bad check by default. But I have figured out some interesting things since then. When I looked up the business name for the check, which is supposed to be what seems like a kid's sports camp, there was nothing online about it. I found a couple of addresses on the white pages, but no phone numbers or official website. The only thing I could find that was written by an actual human was some really bad Better Business Bureau reviews that talked about how this company charged them $1,000 even after their kids' lessons were over. And another review said the whole thing was a scam. When I told my coworker, Kay, about this story, she said she knew the guy from our other location. The store manager there was onto this guy and his fake checks as well. And she told me that one of the younger cashiers there accepted the check from him and now they're just waiting on it to bounce. Now we have a district-wide email about people coming around writing fake checks and to be aware. If you're going to attempt to make a living out of writing bad checks, at least try a little harder. I know he has to run his family sports scam at the same time, but come on man, get it together before you come on stage and perform. Entitled parent teaching entitled kid how to drive hits my car with hers in Target. We've got entitled parent, we've got me, we've got the cop, the entitled kid, we've got little man, the kid I babysit, and we've got helpful lady. So this happened about a week ago. I'm grabbing stuff for the little man at Target for his mom. We grab cookies, blueberries, and other healthy foods other than cookies for lunches and dinners for the next week. The usual. So I put the little man in his car seat and the groceries in the other side. Now, it is to know there is a big truck on our left side and unfortunately we have to try to see behind it. So I'm inching out behind this big truck, unable to see on that side. I roll down my window and ask helpful lady loading up her car next to me if she could look out for me. Then in return, I'll block traffic to help her get out. She was one bag until done. She agreed because, well, it would help her too. So she's guiding me out, making sure there's no cars when I see her jump out of the way and I get hit on my passenger's rear and that's where the little man's car seat is. So I pull forward into my spot. Helpful lady picks herself up and comes to my passenger side, knows the little man is in there. Thankfully, entitled kid didn't hit the door, just the back, but little man is crying. So I get out of my car to call the cops and check the little man. That's when the entitled parent comes out. You hurt my baby. She's just learning how to drive and now look at her. The girl was crying and sure I felt bad. She just got in her first accident, but I was trying to comfort the little man, me. Did you not see helpful lady standing to help me out? There's a really big truck and we can't see over it. Your daughter almost ran over a pedestrian in the parking lot, which by the damage to my car, she was going too fast for a parking lot. Entitled kid. My mom said I could go 15 in a parking lot. I'm calling the cops. You wrecked my new car. Her bumper and mine were dented pretty bad, but hers was the entire front. Mine was the side. Me. That's a good thing to do after you get in an accident. Uh, do you know the non-emergency number? Entitled parent. You need to call 911, not the non-emergency number. My baby is hurt. Me. No one seems to be hurt that badly. We're all walking around and the little man is just scared. We need to call the non-emergency number, not 911. Helpful lady. I'll call. Entitled parent. I was teaching her how to drive. 
You cannot contribute to it in front of her. We were going shopping for her prom shoes. Now everything is ruined thanks to you and your baby. Me. One, I'm his nanny. Two, you told your daughter it was okay to go 15 in a full parking lot with lots of pedestrians. Three, she saw a helpful lady and she didn't think to slow down only to try to speed into a spot that you couldn't see if it was even taken or not. So now we're waiting for the cops who ask for both of our statements. Helpful lady and I have the same story. He interviewed all of us at the same time. They have a completely different one, however. Now we, helpful lady and me, are appearing in court later this month because he ruled an entitled parent's favor and she's suing for damages. Edited for more information. Her lawyer sent me the suing papers this morning as the accident happened last week with over $300 worth of damage to my car. I can't wait for this to play out because lo and behold, when I contacted my lawyer, he found entitled kid has a class for driving, not a learning permit, aka they're not even legal to drive. So I got that going for me. Entitled mom expects a free meal because I forgot her sauce. We've got me, we've got entitled mom, we've got nice girl and the manager. So this is recent. I work at McDonald's. Australians call it Maccas. I've been working there for seven months and I've been having a great time working there. Great managers, except for one, but I won't get into it. Great crew workers and great training. So this happened on a lunch shift on a Saturday, probably the busiest day in my opinion. And we had a lot of customers lining up at the counter whether they're ordering there or coming from the kiosk, self-register. There's this lady who doesn't look anything like a Karen. She had long brown hair, track pants, and a long shirt. It was summer and she had long clothes on. She has a little kid with her, nice girl. She was very shy. Entitled mom orders a six nugget happy meal for her and gets herself a Big Mac with 24 spicy nuggets with four sweet and sour sauces. I put in the order. She pays for it, eating in, and takes a number and sits down at a table. Simple, right? Wrong. I make her drinks for her, a small Sprite and a large Fanta, then put it on the eating tray. Everyone else puts the food on it and I take it out. I put it on her table and she checks everything as I walk away. Um, excuse me, you forgot my daughter's sauce. Me. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I turn to nice girl. I'll get you your sauce. I grab a sweet and sour sauce from the box under the bench and give it to nice girl. She gives me the best smile I've ever seen. It was honestly very cute. I walk over to the drink dispenser to make drinks for customers. Got that done in a couple of minutes. Then afterwards I hear an, excuse me, screech behind me. It was entitled mom, very grumpy. Nice girl was sitting over by the table eating her fries and nuggets. You owe me a free meal. Me, uh, why? Because you forgot my daughter's sauce. Me, but I got it for, I don't care. I want a free meal. My manager steps in. Manager. Uh, is everything alright? No, I deserve a free meal because this worker forgot my daughter's sauce. Manager turns to me. Do you want to explain? Me. So I did forget to put her kid's sauce in. Then I got her sauce for her and walked off. My manager then asks another crew member to run register for a bit and takes me and Entitled Mom to another area so the customers could eat in peace. Entitled Mom took Nice Girl too. She sat near us, eating her nuggets and drinking her Sprite. Manager. Okay, so let me get this straight. So OP forgot to put your kid's sauce in her Happy Meal. He ended up doing it, and now you're expecting a free meal? Yes. No. <gasps> How dare you? It's just sauce. You can't get a free meal for something that costs nothing. Entitled Mom's face went red with rage. She grabs Nice Girl's arm and storms off to her car. Nice Girl says one last sentence before she got in the car. Your nuggets are very yummy. My manager and I gave each other a yeesh look on our face and we go back to our job as normal. After all that, it wasn't busy at all and I ended my shift pretty well. As the next door neighbor, I must clearly be the landlord. My neighbors were moving out of the house they had been renting next to me for the last two years and while I was sad to see them go, I completely understood that they were fed up with the condition of the house and the landlord's dismissiveness to their complaints. They took on far more home improvement and maintenance than they should have been responsible for, some of which I helped them with as we were all friends. After they had vacated and the house was on the market, I was bombarded with all manner of questions from potential buyers and realtors whenever I was outside, usually in the vein of how recently was the roof replaced and questions about flooding. Mostly I was able to answer and did so pleasantly, mostly. 
This one realtor, I'll call him Ted, because he looked like Ted Danson from The Good Place. Anyway, Ted catches me going out to check my mail one afternoon after a long night of taste testing my bourbon to make sure it was still good. Ted darts across the lawn to me and starts firing off some pretty rude questions. Why didn't the previous tenants take care of this place? It's a real dump inside. Who installed that washing machine? Why did they leave it so dirty? Okay, Ted, because I really needed this right now. But again, always trying to be polite, I tell Ted they actually put in more than their fair share of the upkeep. Apparently, that was not sufficient for Mighty Ted. Well, what about the washing machine and the track lighting? Was that done by a professional? At this point, I'm getting pretty close to being done with this whole affair. I don't know, Ted. I've been living in this house over here, not the one you're trying to sell. But surely you would know something about that. No, dude. I'm not the landlord or the owner of that property. So, yeah. Ted. Well, did you at least see some contractors over here doing any work? Me, having completely lost it with this clown. Are we done? Can I go back inside my house now? I don't know. Ted looked pretty taken aback, but honestly, if he had a shred of self-awareness, I wouldn't have yelled at him. His clients looked embarrassed, and who could blame them? Great way to meet the neighbors, by having your realtor badger them with dumb questions. Entitled Dad thinks food service revolves around his kids. So this happened while I was still a bartender. I worked in a city center sports bar, where we had a relatively large food menu for the type of place it was. Nothing crazy, just the usual things like burgers, chicken wings, but a bigger variety. Being a bartender, I never dealt with the food other than maybe clearing a table here and there when it was quiet or if I was bored. This isn't the craziest story ever, just one that really bugged me. I worked here for six months and maybe saw 10 kids in the place in all that time. They were allowed, it just wasn't exactly a place to take them. This story takes place in my final week, so I was already zoned out of the job. One day around 1 p.m., a family of four comes in. Before even taking a seat to look at the menu, Entitled Dad is already at the bar asking to order food. Nothing crazy. I tell him it's table service and a waiter will be over soon. I call a waiter on the radio and they replied that they would be down after they finished with another table. Barely a minute later, the Entitled Dad is back again asking to order and I again say someone will be down soon. Another minute passes, he has finally looked at the menu and realized there's no kids options. I later found out it's a separate menu. He comes over angrily asking where the kids options are and I tell him as far as I know that's the only menu. Like I said, no kids ever really come here so their kids menus are stored upstairs. Straight away he demands a manager as it's unacceptable to not cater to kids. Again, this is a sports bar. So the floor supervisor comes down with kids menus and explains the situation again and they order food. The food is ordered through a till on the bar so I see them put the order through and yet not two minutes later, Entitled Dad is back asking how long the food is going to be because he has places to go. I tell him food normally takes about 20 minutes, but I can ask for an update. I ask a waiter who says they'll ask next time they're in the kitchen, which Entitled Dad did not like at all. He wanted his food now and he wasn't waiting any longer. I tell him there's other people waiting, etc., but he didn't care. He wanted to cancel the order. <laughs> Fine, it probably hadn't started being prepared yet anyway. So I say I'll get a waiter to refund the food as the till system is separate to the bar and this is where he lost it. Apparently, having a separate bar and waiter till so the tills can more easily be counted each day was ridiculous and he demanded I took the money out of my till. Now the tills only open when you make a sale or a supervisor or manager uses their key, which sets the guy off even more. He demands to speak to the manager. Manager comes down, listens to Entitled Dad's story and gives a manager type of response and offers to cancel the food and refund the money. But Entitled Dad now wants the food and a refund, which the manager gives a simple no to. He decides to accept the food, which took a grand total of 22 minutes from order to service. And then as one final pot shot, Entitled Dad comes back to the bar after he has ate and tells me that he is going to get me fired for being useless at my job. I was called into the office the next day because it had to be reported to the head office but was told nothing to worry about. I sometimes miss being a bartender. My mom takes away everything for no reason. I made a Reddit account just to post this story. I'm that upset. So basically some backstory. I've been working at McDonald's for the past two years. I'm 16 and in South Australia you can get hired at 14. So basically in these two years I got myself a nice PC and a setup to go around. I got a 2060 Super and a Ryzen 9 plus 32 gigabytes of RAM. So anyway, 
I built this PC myself when I had saved up enough money from work. I put RGB lights around the edge of my room, put light boxes, and bought lots of decorations for my setup room, with a TV with Chromecast, all linked up to a smart home of course. So basically, I had my dream gaming PC with decorations in my room and everything. I had also collected a bunch of U2s. So, I have been averaging an A- in school, which I would say is decent. I'm doing well, and I'm always kind to people. I'm a pretty happy person, but my mom thinks my PC is ruining me. I've had my PC for a little over a year now, but my mom discovered only a week ago that it was in my room. She told me it's unhealthy to have tech in your room, so I got home from school, did some homework in the dining room, and headed over to my room at about 5 p.m. to play some games with some friends. I noticed my PC is gone. I go to my mom and confront her. She says, oh that, and takes me to her study where she puts her PC and she put my PC next to hers, on the same desk which can barely fit. She told me she's happy with me having it in the study as it doesn't ruin my sleep. She also says as long as I don't use my PC when she is on hers, she'll be happy. It's been a week and I've been really mad. One day I didn't come home from work on a Wednesday night until 1am when she called me and blackmailed me to come home by threatening my PC would be locked up. So yesterday, I kind of tried to make that room where she has her PC a little bit better by moving my decorations. The room is really messy and has her tax return stuck to the wall. It makes my setup look trashy. I set up my RGB and decorations on Saturday before she got home at 3 p.m. from her golf and she sees that I decorated her study with RGB light panels and light strips and she hates it. She goes wild and tells me that I shouldn't decorate her study with the lights. If you never moved my setup in the first place to your study room, I would have never complained. I never even stay up that late. I go to bed at 10 p.m. on weekdays of my own choice and I sometimes stay up to 1 a.m. on Friday nights, but that's rare. Usually I stay up to just 11 p.m. Anyway, I was super happy and living the dream. Now I'm in depression and have anxiety attacks and problems. Only a week later. Everything I worked for was taken away. Thanks, Mom. That's not my truck, Karen. Short backstory. I just got off a 14-hour shift. I work for a utility company, and this took place about 5 a.m. in a smaller suburb of the Twin Cities in January. I stopped for gas at the local Stop and Rob and a few snacks for my upcoming shift at 2 p.m. Another 14-hour shift, lots of overtime. I pull into the station, and the tanker truck is there for a delivery. I get out, fuel up my run-of-the-mill boring box on wheels and started to go into the store. About 5 feet from the entrance, I hear a slight squealing of tires and watched a monstrosity of an SUV, Lincoln Navigator I think, roar around the tanker and parked about 1 foot behind it. I was already beat tired and didn't really think anything of it since people do drive a little nuts around here. I'm in the store looking at what kind of garbage I can eat for the day and maybe a couple energy drinks for later that night. This is when the fun begins. We've got me, we've got Crazy Lady, and we've got Sheriff's Deputy. Lady. Hey, hey, hey. Me. Turns head to look at the lady staring right at me. Lady. You need to move your truck. Me. Puzzled look on my face. Yes, I'm talking to you. You need to move your truck now. Me. Pointing to the salt-crusted SUV at pump number five. You mean that car? No, the tanker truck. It's blocking the tire pump. My tire light is on and I need to fill it up now. I'm in a big hurry. Funny thing is, those tire fillers have about a 20-foot retractable hose on them. Me. That's not my semi. I just watched you walk inside 30 seconds ago. Me. That's not my truck. Now I'm beginning to wonder why she thought I was the truck driver. We probably have the same yellow coats with silver reflective tape that's just as common as blaze orange during deer season. Me. That's not my truck. I don't work here. And get the heck away from me. At this point, one of the local sheriff's deputies walks in right before I say get the heck away from me. I see them here quite a bit in the morning to get coffee. Deputy walks over and asks, is there a problem here? Lady. This guy needs to move his truck. It's blocking the tire pump. I'm in a big hurry and one of my tires is low. Me to the deputy. My car is over there on pump number five and I don't know why this lady thinks I'm the semi-driver. At this point, I'm wondering where the driver is, either in the back office doing paperwork or destroying one of the toilets in the restroom. Deputy to the lady. Okay, show me what you're talking about. They both go outside and walk to the back of the tanker truck. Me. 
I pay for gas and snacks, and here comes the truck driver out of the restroom. It's probably going to need a power washing. As I'm walking out to my car, I see the deputy pointing to back of her car, and they were talking about something. I couldn't hear them. Deputy and lady walk back inside the store just as the truck driver was walking out. Yup, he was wearing a similar coat. I put the snacks in my car, and now curiosity has struck me. I walk over to crazy lady's SUV and saw that it has whiskey plates on them. Maybe it's her, maybe it's her husband's, I don't know. Then I saw it. I couldn't believe my eyes. The license plates showed October 2018. They were 14 months expired. I got a good laugh from that, and I hope crazy lady got a ticket for expired tabs. I went home and got some rest. Server, not servant. We don't work for free. So I work for a place that's a cafe during the day and a nightclub at night. It's an adventure, and I love every minute of it. Sundays are insane. Usually the Saturday night close is rough, but I've learned to expect that, and I won't speak badly about those that served until 3 a.m. and just were too tired to restock some napkins. I get it, dude. Sunday is also walk-in 10 to 16 top day. It never fails. We get large groups back to back. We had a 15-person table come in, and my coworker, Sam, name changed, had it put in his section, and it took up every table he was assigned. Sam is a great server. He's been in the industry for years and knows his stuff. He was attentive, constantly giving refills, making them laugh, etc. As things come to an end, people begin leaving, so Sam asked if the check was all on one. Everyone at his table just looked around at each other, and it was obvious that they had not planned out whether one person was footing the bill or if everyone was going separate. Half the table had left at this point, so one of the older gentlemen said, I guess it's on one. Sam took him the bill, and after they cashed out, they quickly left. This table left him $7 on a $240 check. Sam was devastated. They had been there through the entire lunch rush, so he missed out on a lot of turnaround that made the rest of us some really good money. He told me that he was counting on today so he could make his rent, and now he wasn't sure what to do. He was going to ask to work a double after already working a double the day prior. Side note, I get that people should manage money accordingly, but I don't know his personal life, and some of us have to live day by day. I was there recently. I get it. Zero judgment. I felt so bad for him that I printed off another copy of the check and put $40 into a book with it and stacked it into some books by the register. I pretended that I had lost a signed receipt and was going through them next to him. I casually opened the one with his name in it and said, Sam, you left money in here, you idiot, and handed it to him. I pretended to find mine and casually walked away. He came up to me and said that he was super confused because he had only had one book at the table, but now there was this one. I just looked at him and said, some things aren't worth investigating. I'm telling this story because I want everyone to know that there are good people in the world. We all will get that crappy table or Karens on a bad night, but I'm always looking out for my coworkers. I'm a strong believer in treat others the way you want to be treated, and I'm hoping my message will inspire others to offer to do a little extra side work or bring in some snacks to share during the rush. Little things go a long way in this rough business. We are servers, not servants. My parents don't believe I'm allergic to seafood. When I was 14, I kept getting rashes everywhere that felt like I was on fire. I went to the doctors without my parents because they didn't want to take me. After a few tests, he told me I had an allergy to seafood. When I got home, I told and showed the papers from the doctors. My parents looked at it. Dad, this is fake. You eat fish all the time. Me, no it's not. See it on the papers? It's signed by our family doctor. Dad looks at it. No, it's fake. Rips it up and throws it on the ground. Clean this up. Then go to your room. I'll take your computer out of your room for lying after my show finishes. After that, between 14 and 22, they would try to put fish in my meal. Then say, see, you aren't allergic to fish. I would show them the rashes, but they would say it's because I'm causing them to pop up. The final straw was when I was four months pregnant. I had made dinner, a dish that my sister picked out while shopping with my fiancé at the time, now husband, at the supermarket I worked at. They were picking me up. About 30 minutes after eating it, I felt sick and I threw up. I just thought it was the baby didn't like the food. I went to bed, woke up a few hours later, finding it hard to breathe. I thought it was asthma playing up, but then I touched my face and it was swollen. My partner took me to the hospital and the doctor said it's a bad reaction to an allergy. 
When we got home, my partner checked the jar. He said it had traces of fish in it. I should have checked it before using it. My error. My partner. We are home now. It was an allergic reaction. Dad. To what? Partner. Fish. It had traces in the jar. Mom. No, it was just hay fever. Partner. No, it was fish. If it was worse, you would have lost your grandchild. Dad. Don't be dramatic. She's lying. I left the room, but I heard my parents and partner yelling at each other. Not long after that, we left. Moved nine hours away, been four years, and they still tell me I was wrong. I need to divorce my husband because he's controlling? He's not. They are. Speaking of food allergies, are there any foods that you're allergic to? If so, please let me know. Karen, I'm not a cop. This was an incident well over a decade ago. At the time, I was the supervisor for a state park. It was a Monday morning and I was getting ready to head into town to deposit the weekend's receipts when my assistant told me that our work truck, an old beat up rust bucket of a pickup truck, was almost out of gas. I normally took my own car for the bank run, but took the truck instead so I could refuel it. After finishing the banking, I stopped at a convenience store to fill up the truck and to pick up some snacks, figuring to kill two birds with one stone. Now I was in uniform, but it was the sort that's rather standard to parks. Khaki shirt, dark pants, department badges, and I had a badge and a nameplate. I wasn't a police officer, our uniforms did not look like any police uniform in the state, and my authority was strictly limited to the parks. Right after I entered the store, I heard an EXCUSE ME from behind me. I turn around, and there she was, a Karen. Yes ma'am, I replied. She started on a rant about her neighbors feeding the bears, and one bear had destroyed her bird feeder. It wasn't my problem. I said, I'm sorry to hear that. You should call the game warden. She replied, No, you're a cop. You need to go over there and talk to them right now. I tried again to get through. Ma'am, I'm a park supervisor, not a game warden. You need to contact the game warden. I can give you their number if you want. It didn't sink in. Karen insisted that I drive over there to talk to them, adding she wanted them ticketed and that she didn't understand why I wasn't doing my duty to take care of this. This from a woman who saw me get out of a battered pickup truck with a parks department logo, and my uniform patches and nameplate clearly say I work for the parks department. My patience was at an end. Lady, one more time. I am not a police officer. I have no authority to talk to your neighbors, and I've told you who you need to call. Please let me finish my shopping and get back to my park. With that, I walked away from her, grabbed some snacks, paid for them, and left. All the while listening to her complaining to other customers about the lazy cops in this area who don't do their job. I just shook my head about it on the way back to the park. The next weekend, the game warden for the area stopped by to see how things were going and to check some people's fishing licenses. I told him about my run-in with Karen and he said, Oh, so you're the lazy cop she was complaining about. Yeah, she called and told me what happened. It turned out that her neighbors were people who rented that place for a week and were now gone. He had a talk with the rental owner about it. But Karen? Karen had a virtual bear buffet in her yard, multiple bird feeders, a couple of large bags of bird seed on her back porch, and a deer feeding station she had set up because, as she told the warden, she liked to see the deer. Karen got tickets for bear baiting and illegal feeding of wildlife and almost talked herself into a couple of others by ranting at the warden about those tickets. We had a pretty good laugh over that. Speaking of bears, what's your favorite animal of all time? Please let me know. Library does not equal daycare. I'm still at my local library as I'm writing this, and let me tell you, the ideas of libraries being a safe haven for peace and quiet has long gone out the window. Nowadays, parents leave their kids to run around and make noise like they're in a playground. You'd think they'd be there to actually do some reading, but nope. Usually the parents want to use the computers or talk on the phone while their kids play with the books or use the computers to play games. Now, some parents are good at taking their kids out when they get too noisy, but what I witnessed a few minutes ago was a new low for these noisy entitled parents. We've got the girl, the librarian, and the entitled mom. So I'm borrowing one of the local computers when I see poor girl looking about two or three crying her eyes out with no parents to be found. Librarian, a nice lady at the front desk, approached her and asked, where's your mommy? Are you lost? 
The girl nodded, and Librarian took her hand. Come on, let's go find her together. Librarian calmed her down as they walked, asking her what her name was or what her mom looked like. I awed a little in my head when I heard that. A few minutes later, I overhear what sounded like Librarian and the entitled mom in question a few rooms down. I was mainly annoyed by how loud the place was, but then I couldn't help listening in. Apparently, Entitled Mom had left her daughter in the kids book section so that her son could use the computer lab, with only one computer available, to play games. Librarian told her that the Entitled Mom needed to watch both of her kids and that the librarians wouldn't be able to watch them, especially not someone her age. Here's what I could roughly make out. Entitled Mom Oh, you can watch her. I can't leave my son here. Librarian I'm sorry, but we can't just let her be here by herself either. You can let her stay in the lab with you, or you can bring them both to this section. Entitled Mom groans. Fine, whatever. Entitled Mom ended up scolding the girl for leaving that section, making the poor kid cry again. Then the son started crying because his sister was being too noisy. You and me both, kiddo. Before long, Entitled Mom was angrily walking out with her two crying kids in tow. At least this Karen had the sense to do that. The day I can finally use a computer at home will be one of grand celebration. When your niece turns out to be an entitled Karen. Once again, I'm sitting in my favorite booth that overlooks the entire restaurant when I see a familiar face walk in. It was my niece and she had some friends with her. It must have been one of her girls' night out. We were rather crowded and there was a bit of a wait. I went back to eating and doing the end of month paperwork and heard my niece say rather loudly, You will seat me now. Do you know who my uncle is? I can have you fired just like that. And Tammy, the hostess, tried telling her there were no seats. But my niece wanted nothing to do with that. She said, My uncle practically owns this place. Mr. H, you know who that is, right? Tammy nodded her head. Yeah, I know who he is. I see him in here all the time. My niece said, Well then, you know I could have your job just like that. All I have to do is make one phone call and you're gone, missy. I was livid. My niece was using my name to get a free ride, something I frown on. I even looked down on nepotism. I got up and walked up behind her as she continued her rant of how she deserves to be seated. Tammy smiled when I spoke up. Hello, Lissa. Nice to see you here. Oh, hi, uncle, she said sweetly. I was just explaining how I know you and that you're my uncle. You're using my name to get a free meal, and I do not appreciate it. These people, unlike you, work for a living. And I know your father is going to be very disappointed when I call him and tell him how you were treating these people. But uncle, she was being really snotty to me. Lissa, don't you dare lie to me. Tammy was being nothing but sweet and pleasant, so don't you even dare try it. Lissa squealed out. But uncle. But nothing. I don't want you trying to be a mooch, and I don't approve it, and your father sure wouldn't. I apologized to her friends and told them they would have to vacate the restaurant now. Tammy, you see Lissa in here, you have the right to throw her out, and I will contact the managers of the other two restaurants not to seat you if they hear you drop my name or give any free meals. Lissa, I am so disappointed in your behavior right now. Just go. Lissa stomped off with her friends, screaming she was going to tell her daddy. No, you won't, because your dad will side with me. I know he doesn't promote this type of attitude, and I know he didn't raise you this way. Now go. It's been several years since then. She still doesn't talk to me. Her dad apologized for her behavior. Why, I don't know. It's not his fault. He's a good man and tells me he didn't raise her to be like that. But it's okay. He made her get a job. Working for me. Yes. I made her work as a dishwasher and said my name better not drift out of her mouth to gain favoritism with others. I still think she's ticked off. But oh well. I still have the respect of my employees. I moved out, Entitled Parents Attempted to Play Victim. In previous posts, I mentioned I moved out when I turned 18. The day after my birthday, my boyfriend came over and helped me pack up my stuff. Of course, this went smoothly and I stayed with him until we could find a permanent place of our own. His parents welcomed me into their house, but I didn't want to burden them. We start up our search for a home as soon as we could get to it. This is when weird things started to happen. I got a few calls the next week. They were all from family members and they were all saying that they were planning to disown me if I didn't make up for my mistakes. This was weird as I've never met most of them in my entire life. However, when my aunt called, everything came to a light. We've got Susan, entitled mom. Kevin, entitled dad. Laura, nice aunt. Paul, nice uncle. Andrew, my cousin. 
Red, me, and Schroeder, boyfriend of mine. Laura, did your relatives call you? Me, yes, they did. What did I do? Oh, you did nothing. Your mother told everyone in the family group chat about how you disrespected them and attempted to hurt them if they didn't let you run away. Me, nice to know. After that tiny conversation, I decided to block out my relatives. The only people I didn't block were my aunt, uncle, and cousin. The three of them were the only real family I had ever had before I met Schroeder. Thank goodness for me, they didn't believe my parents' sob story of how I was threatening them. Blocking out my relatives seemed to make it worse. They had my email and spammed me every day, demanding I move back in with my parents and make it up to them. Of course, I sent them, and I mean every single one of them, the true story of why I left. They didn't believe the story since they said I was a compulsive liar, so I left it alone. Two months after moving in with my boyfriend, my grand aunt came by and practically tried to take me back to my family. She wasn't even able to make it out the door as Schroeder might not be home, but his third elder sister was. She stopped my grand aunt and kicked her out of the door. Schroeder's sister literally lifted up her leg and pushed my grand aunt out by her back. Grand aunt, this is harassment. I'm going to sue. Schroeder's sister, go ahead. Then you can explain how you tried trespassing on our property. That was the end of it for grand aunt. She never came by and according to my aunt, she never sued either. That was just the beginning of things. The next visit came with my aunt. This aunt was from my father's side and was always protecting my family because he is her little brother. She told me I should go back and apologize for hurting my parents like that. I explained to her that I have no idea what she was talking about. She got in my face and yelled that I should be in prison. Needless to say, since we were having the conversation at the door, I slammed it in her face. Not long after my nice aunt called me again. Red, you better be careful. You know your parents are planning something with the others. Me. Will do. Thanks for the heads up, Aunt Laura. Turns out their big plan was to expose me for the jerk I am. It actually worked for a while because I wasn't the most well-known person. I was really thinking of moving back in to get them to stop. They tried to lie their way and say how bad of a son I was and how I was always drinking. All of my relatives showed it to their friends through their personal chat in their phones. Eventually, one of their friends showed it to Schroeder's mother, who immediately debunked the entire lie as she uploaded the video Schroeder took the day he helped me move. The video eventually got sent back until it reached my relatives. The contents of the video were simple. He was recording and then he pointed the camera at my parents' house. The door opened to reveal I came out with my suitcase, my parents doing absolutely nothing. My relatives messaged me saying how sorry they were, but I got them on block. I don't want to deal with them anymore. Coworker feels entitled to my room. This happened a few years ago at my old job. I worked closely with a woman my age to provide tech support in our office and staff trainings. The woman, who I'll call Jessie, was nice enough at first and we had a lot in common. Unfortunately, she was also very self-centered and prone to dramatic episodes. She dated a coworker in our office in a tumultuous on-again, off-again relationship. In my first month with the company, they broke up the same morning we were to hold the training and Jesse faked an illness to get his attention, leaving me to give the training alone. There were other episodes involving the two of them and her dating other guys at work that led me to avoid her in social situations. My avoiding her really upset her and led her to make passive-aggressive social media posts. She also started to unfairly pass on crappy work assignments to me instead of splitting them between us. I never bid on the drama, did my work, and kept my head down. Anyhow, we both end up attending a conference together out of state. As the trip started, I tried to be as cordial as possible as I was very excited for the trip and wanted to have fun. We get to the resort where the conference is being held and check into our condo. The condo has two bedrooms, three baths, with a full kitchen and living room. As we walk in, Jesse immediately runs into a nice looking bedroom on the left and claims it as her own, jumping on the bed. I walk into the bedroom on the right and lay down. After 20 minutes of chilling in our separate rooms, Jesse walks into my room talking about how nice the condo is, then makes a face. She says, Oh, you have the master bedroom. I shrug. I thought they looked the same. I go peek into her room and sure enough, I do have the master bedroom. Despite this distinction, there isn't much of a difference between the rooms. Both have full baths with separate showers and garden tubs. Both have vaulted ceilings. The big difference was my ceiling was vaulted a little more by two to three feet and the room was a few feet bigger. As we attend the evening conference activities, Jessie is huffy and sulking about her room. 
She won't admit she's upset about my having the master room, so she starts complaining about feeling claustrophobic. Yes, that's what she thinks the condition is called, because the ceiling isn't high enough. Mind you, her ceiling is vaulted in the condo and she has standard height, flat ceilings at home. If she truly felt claustrophobic, I don't know how she can be living in her own house. We get back to the condo for the evening with her still complaining about her claustrophobic room. I can see she's hoping to wear me down into switching rooms with her. Instead, I cheerily say, well, have a good night and head into my master bedroom. I wake up the next morning and see her sprawled out on the couch in the living room. She really committed herself to her performance over the bad bedroom and glares at me. I couldn't sleep in that claustrophobic room. For the rest of the trip, she avoided me, which was fine by me. Give me that charger. So I have an orange and black portable charger that I've had for four years now, and that thing has saved my life quite a few times. It has four USB ports and a high-powered light, so it's pretty great. The thing about mine, however, is that my port closest to the light doesn't work. I don't know why, overuse I think, so I use the other ones. Enter Entitled Mom and Entitled Kid. I had seen them around a bit, but had never talked to them, which is unusual as I live in quite a small community, but now I know a lot about them. For context, this was in a local cafe I frequent on the weekends. A family owned, everyone is welcome kind of deal. Well, Entitled Parent and Entitled Kid enter and immediately spot me sitting down, sipping my tea. Yes, I'm Scottish, we drink a lot of tea, and charging my phone with the charger. They almost run at me, and they say, in the worst Ned or idiotic accent imaginable, entitled mom. Excuse me, what is that? Points at charger. Me. Oh, it's a portable charger. It's like a power outlet for cape entitled parent cutting me off. I know that. I meant, can we use it? Me. Wondering how what's that translates to, can we use it? Eh, sorry, but I don't let people use my things usually. Why do you need it? I'm thinking that if their phones are dead, they can use my charger to get them up and running. Her phone was at 47%. Yeah, that's not going to cut it. Me. Sorry, your phone doesn't need charging. It has 47%. Oh, come on. It isn't full. Give me the charger. She reaches for it, as does the kid, but I pull it away and stow it in my bag. Me. Sorry, I need to go now. I quickly sip up the last drop of tea and head to the counter to pay. I see them following, so tell the worker, who I'm friends with, about them before I get there. She has also seen me with my charger. I leave just as they get to me, still clutching my bag and head for home. I get home and realize that my charger isn't in my bag. I knew what had happened. They stole it when they came to the counter. I'm bummed, but have a smaller spare, so decided to go back to the cafe to see if I somehow left it. I arrive, and amazingly, Entitled Parent and Entitled Kid are sitting there using my charger out in the open. I calmly approach my friend and let her know, and she's in on it. Me, going up to Entitled Parent and Entitled Kid, who look really scared. Oh, thank goodness, you found my charger. I knew I had left it here, thank you so much. Entitled Mom. Um, this is mine. Go away, weirdo. Me, realizing she isn't going down without a fight. Oh, okay. I can prove it's mine. I call my friend over like a stranger and tell her the story. Me. Is there anything wrong with this charger, miss? Entitled mom, confused. No, it's brand new. Got it today. Go away. I want to be compensated for this intrusion. Wow, she's dumb. Me. The charger nearest the light doesn't work on mine. Can we try this one? Entitled parent now tries to excuse herself to the toilet, realizing she's being found out. It fails, and she is forced to show that, indeed, the port doesn't work. Long story short, I get my charger back, and she is barred for a week, even though she apparently wasn't local, just on travels in the area, so probably thought she could grab and go with the charger. Me, one. Entitled parent and entitled kid, zero. Speaking of phones, which do you prefer, Apple or Android? Please let me know right now. My HOA complaint broke up an entitled mom's marriage. This happened a few years ago, but I still think about it. After being blessed with great neighbors over the years, I started taking it for granted. Then Luna, her four dogs, all the same breed, and family, 
two teens and her husband, moved in the house next door. It started off well enough. Luna was friendly and the kids and husband seemed nice, but she soon decided that the best place for her dogs to go potty was my backyard. I didn't agree and after suffering in silence for a few weeks, I'm not very confrontational. I finally told her that my backyard wasn't her personal dog park. When they got home from work, they would let their dogs loose to go running in my backyard to play and go potty. One day, I happened to catch them and came out on my patio to tell them to cut it out. The dogs turned around and started running towards me while barking aggressively. Fortunately, her husband called them off before the little ankle biters got to me. And it wasn't just the dog that liked to hang out in my backyard. Luna liked to walk around my backyard while talking on her phone. One of the things I like about my house is the privacy. It backs to the woods, so I don't have a lot of curtains on my back windows and doors. But since Luna liked walking around my yard, I was forced to curtail my habit of cleaning while not dressed. And it was creepy. Once, after it had snowed, I realized that someone had walked up to my back patio and had been peeping in my French doors. Not long after, someone left a gift of poo on my front porch welcome mat. Jeez, I wonder who did that. But then, Luna seemed to want to repair our rather rocky relationship and asked me what time I got off work. We could do drinks and hang out. I thought, whatever. So I told her, but no get-together ever materialized. I realized later that she just wanted to know what time I got home from work. What she didn't know was that I sometimes worked at home. On one of those days, I caught her once again letting her dogs loose in my yard, so I took a photo and sent it to the HOA. I think she was also sneaking her dogs into my other neighbor's fenced backyard. The ramifications were swift. That complaint was the straw that broke the camel's back. The marriage was already on shaky ground and the husband was tired of her and her dog hoarding. I only saw four dogs at a time, but there were more. I didn't notice because they all looked alike. The next thing I knew, she and the dogs had moved back to South America, the kids went to live with relatives slash college, and the husband was acting like someone who won the lottery. He always seemed somewhat grumpy before, but after she left, he was smiling and friendly. Then he bought a Harley, got a girlfriend, and proceeded to rid the house of copious amounts of urine-stained carpets. He was eventually evicted from the house. Yes, they were renters, because owners were sick of the complaints and fines and decided to move back in. Luna apparently had a gift for upsetting the neighbors on my block. The weird thing is that there were a couple of vacant lots and a dog park less than a block away, but apparently her neighbor's yards were the best place to take her dogs. Do you have a dog? If so, what kind? Students pranked me. I had the last laugh. I spent about 10 years teaching high school humanities at a small private school. For my first two years, I didn't have a classroom, just a small office. I would bring what I needed for each class on a cart and go from room to room, depending on which teacher had a prep at any given time. This was incredibly inconvenient and, not being the most organized of teachers to begin with, made things difficult to keep track of. There were a group of 11th grade boys who decided to make things a little more difficult for me. They were good kids, we got along well. I coached several of them on the school soccer team, but they decided that since my office would often be empty, it was a great place to prank. It would never be anything too serious, things falling over when I opened the door, or things disappearing for a day and then turning up in a different place the next day. Nothing was ever damaged, and I could never prove who it was, even though I knew. My school had mandatory final exams in each academic course. I didn't really think they were necessary, so I would generally make them pretty easy with a lot of preparation. I would give out study sheets and play review games for a couple of weeks before the test, and there was no reason the students wouldn't do well on them. I had approval of admin to do this, as they weren't particularly fond of the final exam rule either. It was a school board policy. A few nights before the offending boys had their exam, I had a brainwave. I created a second exam. Gone were the multiple choice questions and obvious things from the review sheets. In their place came detailed questions about concepts that were briefly mentioned in class. Essay question after essay question, ambiguous questions with no clear answers, definitions of words that there was no way they knew. It took a couple of hours, but I laughed the whole time. When the test came, I had the special exams at the bottom of the pile and handed them out to each of the four or five boys. 
I told my vice principal what was happening and he insisted on being present. I started the timer and watched as the boys flipped over their papers. It was all I could do to keep a straight face. Eyes went wide, heads were shaking, panic was setting in, especially as they saw all their classmates flying through their exams. One of the boys raised their hand. Sorry, no questions during the final. You should be prepared based on your study sheets. I let them go for about 5 or 10 minutes of terror before I gathered the fake tests and gave them the real ones. They all passed with flying colors and never pranked my office again. It was glorious. How dare you not offer vegetarian meals? I work at a small local pizza slash Italian place. A few hours during the day, we offer a lunch buffet with pizza, pasta, salads, etc. It's immensely popular and we're usually packed to capacity every lunch period. And honestly, the food is really good and has a good reputation in town. I come in contact with all kinds of jerks and weirdos at work, don't we all? But I really hate the ones who like to complain in order to get something free. So these two ladies in their 40s come in and stare at the menu for a while. We have counter service, so I greeted them kindly and told them to let me know when they were ready to order. They asked me how long it would take for a small veggie pizza to be ready. I told them about 15 minutes. One sister scoffs loudly. Ugh, we don't have time for that. I suggested that they try our buffet since we still had it. They inspect the buffet offerings, clearly not really interested in it because they complained about everything. Everything has meat in it. We can't eat anything here. We are vegetarians. One sister is literally yelling, so I nicely showed them all the meat-free options to help them out. I showed them the salad bar, pasta salad, cheese pizza, broccoli bites, cheese ravioli, spaghetti, etc. The mean sister yells at me, did you not hear me? I said we're vegetarians, and this spaghetti sauce clearly has meat in it. I said, no, actually it's just a marinara tomato sauce, no meat at all. After all that hateful deliberation, they decided to eat the buffet. Okay, cool. Finally, we came to a decision. A little bit after, I start bussing tables in between customers. Mean sister starts yelling again, shouting for me across the dining room, snapping her fingers at me. Hey, miss, excuse me. I quickly walk over to their table. I ask if everything is okay. Mean sister tells me, not at all. This food is absolutely disgusting and inedible. I notice there's at least four or five empty plates on their table from where they've eaten and she shoves them at me and I had to reach over to prevent them from falling to the floor. I was about ready to snap at them, but somehow managed to say, I'm sorry to hear that, and she cuts me off and rudely demands a refund. I didn't even respond and walked away to find my manager. My manager has no patience for complaining customers and usually avoids refunds whenever possible. He refused to refund them since they finished off a few plates of each before saying they didn't like it. Eventually, they left in a huff. We have several vegetarian regulars who come in and usually get a lot of compliments on our options. Some people just have a, I'm going to start crap vibe and can't be pleased. Speaking of pizza, what's your favorite pizza place? Mine's definitely Pizza Hut. Please let me know. Entitled Mom Invades the Library. Here's our cast of not so lovable characters. We've got Entitled Mom, we've got me, and we've got Entitled Mom's kids. So I work at a public library, and this is my third year working there. I love my job for the most part, and it's lots of fun because I get to work with books and all that fun stuff. But every once in a while, I just get a lot of really bad patrons coming in. Some of them are entitled, sure, but this entitled mom takes the cake for the worst. I know that I'm about to deal with a bad group as soon as I hear what sounds like a stampede of water buffalo coming down the stairs. I work in the basement section. Joined by the sounds of screaming kids. Enter seven kids, all filing in one by one. I thought they would never end. I try to reassure myself that I can do this, but boy, was I wrong. Entitled Mom comes to the desk and asks to get library cards for her three youngest, a trio of triplets. Easy enough. I give her the form and wait for her to come back with it filled out. One of her kids starts trying to rob me of all the decorations we have scattered around my area which was exhausting by itself because it seemed like she had a new thing in her hand every five seconds and obviously entitled mom wouldn't help because her kids were angels. 
Entitled Mom comes back and gives me the forms for her triplets and I start to fill them out when I realize something is off. All three of the triplets have the exact same name. I tried asking her if this was correct and she said, Of course, can't you read? Like, yes, I can read, but I was just trying to clarify because naming three of your kids the same thing isn't really common. On top of that, she keeps referring to them by their middle names and expects me to magically know which one I'm referring to. Like, come on lady, I don't know their middle names, not my fault. I proceed to start transferring the information she filled out onto the computer system. After a minute or so, Entitled Mom is glaring at me. I wonder what is wrong, but keep working anyways. You're going too slow. You need to hurry up. Transferring information takes some time, especially when it's the same thing over and over. I'm going as fast as I can because I want her and her spawn to leave. I eventually get done and give her the triplets cards. They go away from the desk for a few minutes, but I am not safe yet. All seven kids suddenly run at the counter and put like 40 movies on the desk that they all want to check out. They are all trying to give me their library card at once. The other four kids already had ones apparently and all are screaming at me. By this point, my body has already gone into survival mode. Entitled Mom is standing by while all of this is happening, not even bothering trying to control her kids. I check out all of the movies to them one by one, all while Entitled Mom is still glaring at me. She must think I have super speed or something because my body was in fight or flight mode and I was checking them out as fast as I could. The one from before that was trying to steal stuff comes behind the counter while I was distracted and noticed I had candy hidden behind the desk. For good kids, of course, which they were not. All seven of them try to run behind the counter and I have to stop them from messing up everything. I give them the candy and they eventually leave the area behind the counter. Note that Entitled Mom still wasn't helping at all. Entitled Mom. Thanks for your help, I guess. It wasn't very quick. Me. You're welcome. After this, I am finally free of the grasps of my librarian duties. My coworker walks in and I tell her my tale of woe. I am finally safe, but that was the most energy draining experience of my professional life. Overall, this experience only lasted about 20 minutes, but it felt like eternity. I hope to never encounter them again. How to deal with entitled Richards. I've been in customer service for a very long time now. I have worked all over the place but customer service was always in the background and honestly, I don't mind it. It has taught me many lessons from being a part-timer who gives no hoots to the manager and having the fun of managing younger employees in a retail environment. I can keep my cool and occasionally I have even put my foot down a few times. I'm not very confrontational, so for me, that's a big deal. I have also learned to be pretty diplomatic and can defuse many situations. This story is of when I was managing a small, locally owned store that sold media, among other things. This one customer, who I would refer to as Richard, was one of the unfortunate regulars that I could tell many stories about, but today I'll tell one of my favorites that makes me laugh to this very day. Cast, we've got jerk regular, Richard. We've got coworker, and we've got me, the one who the Karens demand to see. Richard is a grumpy oldish man, around 55 to 60. He's a bit stocky, owns his own business, and yet very, very cheap. Every time Richard comes in, he always haggles for something. He knows that I'm the manager, so he knows who to come to if he wants something done for him without the answer being, uh, sorry, I can't do that. Maybe ask my manager? Richard picks up a TV show DVD set that's $14.99. He hums and haws, scoffs and sighs, complaining that it's just so expensive. I just brush it off as Richard being Richard, hoping I'd knock off some of that price because he feels he is entitled to special treatment. Richard. Hmm, well, $14.99 is pretty expensive. Me. I'm sorry you feel that way. My coworker sees this and notices his least favorite customer has entered our store and keeps a good distance. Richard. Well, can you do anything about the price? Me. Sorry, Richard, but I can't change the prices. It's too expensive. I shouldn't have to pay this much. Me. Maybe in time, the price will drop and if we see it in again, you can buy it then. Sadly, that's all I can do. Richard continues to mull it over, hoping that I'd fall for his tactic. I don't, obviously. I just let him be for a moment, 
getting back to work behind the counter, which is still close to him. Richard. It's $14.99? He says this in a way that implies only $14.99, which does not include the tax. I catch what he's implying and respond. Me. $14.99 plus tax, yes. Richard scoffs. Oh, tax? No way. Me. Yes, tax would be added. Such an awkward conversation to have when we both know he's trying to play me. I shouldn't have to pay the tax. Me. Everybody pays the tax, Richard. Unless you have a government-issued card telling me otherwise, you are required to pay the tax if you want to buy that. No, I shouldn't have to pay the tax. Everybody pays taxes, Richard. This is a normal thing. If you feel it's too expensive, you don't have to buy it. This goes back and forth for a few minutes. Finally, after some more humming and hawing, he says, Fine, I'll take it. I say great and start to ring him through. He even scoffs when the tax has been added and I tell him his grand total. My coworker at this point walks over to make sure everything's running smoothly, pretending there's work to do by the register counter, just in case. Richard reluctantly pays for the item and brings out his stamp card. Now, we have a pretty typical stamp card. Whenever you spend a certain amount per item, any items over that amount get you a stamp. For example, if you buy two items that were $10 each, you'd qualify for two stamps. He bought one item that was over the mark and was entitled to one stamp. I stamped his card and handed it back to him. This is when he applies his typical pressure to get more stamps. I should get more stamps because I paid the tax. Me, still maintaining a chipper attitude. As I said, Richard, everyone pays the tax. It doesn't qualify you for a free stamp. I should get extra stamps. He then taps the stamp card on the counter and stares me dead in the eyes with his experienced sour face like he had connections with the mob or something. He's trying to intimidate me. As I mentioned, he's a bit stocky and I'm a girl who looks like an easy mark. However, this isn't my first rodeo. I keep eye contact and say, sorry, I can't, with a smile to keep it friendly. He taps again. Me. Nope. Sorry. Finally, I give in. I reveal a huge smile and in the most exaggerated friendly tone, I tell him, you know what I can give you? A bag. That's just plain free. I say that last part a bit slower to make it sound more special. Instantly, my coworker almost loses it but stops himself. He's standing right beside me and has to turn around for a moment to compose himself. Richard doesn't even know how to handle what just happened. He just looks at me dumbfounded. I'm still smiling, still offering the bag. He won. He got something for free. How could he argue back? It was the most subtle malicious compliance he had probably received from someone in customer service. He took his stamp card, his DVD set, and his bag and left without saying a word. Good old Richard. I wonder what he's up to these days. Entitled Karen tries to claim my phone as her own. So I was sitting at KFC playing on my phone when Innocent Kid saw and asked what game I was playing. Hey mister, what game is that? Me. Oh, this? It's called Jetpack Joyride. You basically have to try to go the furthest without touching lasers or zappers. Oh, cool. And proceeds to go back to his mom. Mind you, I'm sitting at my table waiting for my food to be called. Entitled Karen. Excuse me, can my son play on your phone? You see, I don't have that game installed and can't find it. Apparently, she doesn't know what Google Play Store is. Me. Sorry, ma'am but I can't as I just recently got this phone and don't want anything bad happening to it. But the app is on the Play Store if you want to download it. Karen, I have no data on my phone. She said this with a slight smirk. And my son really wants to play it. Me, look, I would if I could, but I also need my phone as I'm waiting on a very important phone call, which should be happening any time now. This was a lie. I just wanted her to go away and leave me alone. Karen, obviously you're not as I can clearly see you are playing a game. Me. Yeah, I'm playing a game to pass the time. Doesn't stop me from answering calls. She huffed and stormed off. I heard my order being called and decided to go collect it from the counter. Me being me, I decided to leave my phone on the table and boy, shouldn't have done that. When I got back, it was gone and I immediately looked at entitled Karen's table and my phone was in her hand as she was giving it to her kid. I go to her table. Me. Excuse me, what the heck do you think you're doing taking my phone? I told you my son wanted to play your game, and what my kid wants, my kid gets. Me. You have till a count of three to hand it back, 
before I get the police involved. Innocent Kit goes to give me the phone back when Entitled Karen takes it out of his hand. I told you my son wanted to play on your game. I start to count with my hand out. Karen calls for someone over. Employee. What seems to be the problem, ma'am? This guy is trying to steal my phone. Employee looks at me. Is this true, sir? Me. If it was true, do you think I would still be standing here? The truth is that this lady took my phone off my table when I went to grab my order and will not give it back. You liar! Me. You see this watch? I point to my watch. It's a smart watch, and the beauty of this thing is, it has a find my phone feature, which when pressed, will make my phone make an audible noise. Karen starts to lose her color a little bit and thinks I'm bluffing. Me to Entitled Mom. Shall I show you? Karen. I just realized I'm late for an appointment. No, you sit right there. I tap my watch a few times, and to her amazement, my phone actually went off in her hand. Uh, sorry, that's my notification sound. She stuttered here. I proceeded to press my watch again, to which the phone went off again. Employee to Karen. Ma'am, I suggest you give this guy his phone back. Everyone is staring at this point, with my anxiety skyrocketing. I hate being the center of attention. Karen. He must have hacked my phone with his watch. I managed to snatch the phone back and looked at employee. Here's how I can prove this is my phone. There are three ways of unlocking it. Facial recognition, biometrics, fingerprint, and the good old password. I unlocked all three times, and to add salt to injury, I proceeded to show my ID to employee, saying, keep a note of this, and proceeded to check my gallery whilst she was looking at my ID. Me. I always keep a picture of my ID on my phone just in case it gets stolen and I have no chance of getting it back. I wipe it clean. Employee checks the picture. Employee. Want me to call security? Me. Yes, please. I get my phone back and allow the kid to play a game or two whilst his mom was ranting and raving about how they should believe her and I was allowed to steal her phone. Turns out, from what the kid was telling me, this isn't the first time this has happened. My meal was refunded and basically on the house because of all the trouble. How I love Karens. You cannot have my rabbit. So I have a rabbit. I'm not 100% sure what his breed is, but he's definitely a black otter mix. He looks exactly like a black otter. Black fur, white stomach, brown patch behind his ears. But the thing about my rabbit is, he's blind. He had an infection in his eyes when he was six weeks old, so his mother abandoned him. I took him as a 16th birthday gift and I paid for everything for him. Sometimes mom will help pay for his spring mix because she's already there and thinking about it. I like to take Mikado, my rabbit, uptown because I like him to be social, decent with loud noises, friendly and good with kids. I've been taking him uptown since the day I got him and I've thankfully succeeded in getting him friendly and social. The pet store in town adores him, like they know me and him by name at this point. They'll hold things I bought, because I walk, and dragging back a bag of hay and a rabbit is tiring. I was uptown with Mikado and decided to stop at a pet store. A kid came up to me when I was comparing hay prices and Mikado was chilling on my shoulder. He likes it up there. Don't know why, but he's been sitting there since he was tiny. This kid wasn't entitled or anything, and they were like 12 or 13, so they'll be nice kid. Nice kid. Can I hold your rabbit? Me. Sure, I'll hand him to you and show you how to hold him. So I did that. The kid holds Mikado and pets him before asking about his eyes, so I give him the story. As I'm doing so, their mom comes over. Karen. Is that a rabbit? Me. Yeah, it is. You're welcome to pet and hold him if you want. How much is he? Um, pardon me? How much is he? You work here, don't you? Me. No, I don't. I'm sorry. If you want a rabbit, there is one in the back you can adopt through the SPCA. I don't want that one. I want the one you have. She's cute, and I like her blue eyes. She is actually a he. His name's Mikado, and he's my rabbit. You can't have him. Karen. I'm going to tell your manager you're not selling the rabbit. And with that, Karen stomps off. Her kid apologizes and gives Mikado back. I shrug it off as I deal with worse people at work. I've got plenty of stories if you want to hear those too. I continue looking at Hay when Karen comes back with a worker. Karen. That's the person. Worker. No ma'am, he's right. That is his rabbit. Karen. What do you mean? That's obviously not his rabbit. Worker. 
That is OP's rabbit. OP's rabbit is called Mikado, and he didn't adopt Mikado from here. Fine, I'm leaving and never coming back if you won't sell me the rabbit. Me. There's lots of rabbits in the shelter you can adopt. They'll be litter trained and thankful to you for saving them. Don't rabbits live in cages? This upsets me. I was thinking we were past rabbits living in cages, but guess not. So I tell Karen that rabbits don't belong in cages. It went in one year and out the other one. Karen just huffed and left. The worker apologized endlessly. I said it's fine and let the worker parade around the store happily with Mikado. Karen loses it at the theme park I work at. So to set the scene, I had my supervisor come up to me and tell me that I had to go relieve someone on a ride. This would happen from time to time as people would need to use the bathroom or go on breaks or whatever else. I didn't question it. The ride in question had a 54 inch height requirement and parents were not allowed to accompany kids who were too short in this case. That being said, when this operator started letting people off, I saw that she had let on a kid that wasn't tall enough. I turned to my supervisor and confirmed she was going on final warning for a safety violation. Safety violations are two strikes and you're out. As I've said before in my previous posts, we take safety very seriously. This kid and his parent come back to the ride. Let's meet the group. We've got me, I've got entitled parent, and sweet kid. Me goes to measure the kid. I'm sorry, you have to be this tall. Tapping the height on the stick they clearly didn't meet in order to ride. No exceptions, sorry. Kid, okay, entitled parent. I think you're mistaken, sir. We were just on this ride, we can go on. Me, no you can't. As I stated, you have to be this tall. Again, gesturing to the height stick in order to ride the ride. Otherwise, it isn't safe, entitled parent. We were just on the ride. The nice girl that was here before you let us on. Don't be a jerk. Me. Actually, I'm here now because she let you on. It's a safety violation. We take things very seriously here at our amusement park. It is safe. We were just on the ride. Let us on. Me. Sorry, as I said, she cannot work here anymore due to the safety violation she caused by letting your kid on. Entitled parent gets a look of an idea on their face. I can be with her on X ride and Y ride, so why can't I join her on this ride? Me. Yes, you can accompany her on those rides, however- So let us do it on this ride. Me. No. Why are you being mean to us? Me. Honestly through with this. Because I don't want to be fired for a safety violation? Where does it say I can't accompany her, huh? You can check the sign at the entrance queue. There was no one else in line. Or if that isn't enough to convince you, I have a sheet in my booth detailing the height requirements for each ride and whether or not a guardian can accompany them. Entitled Parent strides off confidently. I'll show you the sign says I can accompany her. Me. Smiles and waits. Entitled Parent. Forget you. Storms off with their kid in tow. Me. With no one around. Have a good rest of your day. Hope you all enjoyed this story of me being tormented by Entitled Parents as much as the last. If you like this one too, there's still plenty more to share. You threaten my job? I take yours. I was about six months into a food service job at the time. I worked in my university's cafeteria, prepping and serving food to the students. After closing, I took about 45 minutes to finish cleaning up my station and took another 10 to finish up one of my coworker sections that she needed a bit of help with. My supervisor had left just after closing to God knows where, leaving the rest of us to our devices as they usually did. He was more of the watch and rule type. After I had finished, I took a quick 5 minute trip to the bathroom as I usually did around this time every day. As I happily walked to the back to assist in helping the others finish so we could all leave, I hear a cough behind me. The sound of the calm before the storm. I ignore it, thinking nothing of it and go on my way. I hear a more abrupt, <coughs> and I stop and turn on my heel to meet the shift supervisor's cold gaze, his hands crossed over his puffed chest in his regal stance. I give him a questioning look as he looks on expecting me to read his mind. Supervisor. A half an hour? He asks calmly but with a sour tinge to his tone. Me, confused, I chuckle. Huh? This was apparently the worst thing I could have done. Supervisor. You were in the bathroom for half an hour! He yelled, stomping his royal foot. I was taken aback as he had never come at me with a sideways tone before. I thought we were cool but I should have known better seeing how he treated my coworkers. I was so shocked, I just stood there, 
staring at him like he grew three horns. I didn't feel the need to defend myself in the moment as I knew the words he was spitting my way was pure BS. Supervisor, do you like your job? He demanded from me. I did not, in fact, like my job. I had trouble holding back my smile at this thought as he yelled some more things I don't remember as my ears had gone numb to his screeching at this point. I knew he had no power to fire me and I hadn't even seen his mug for the past hour. I knew his words had no consequence. I had nothing to say to his tantrum and as soon as he realized that, he dismissed me. I have trouble egging people on when they are being so irrational, so generally I stay quiet and let them get out their baby fit. I quickly went back to my work and started scheming about how I could get back at this man. Over the next week, I compiled photo evidence of him slacking on the job, serving undercooked food, and statements from my coworkers about their individual experiences where he ridiculed or threatened them, and I took it straight to my boss that Friday. I laid out all of my evidence and my personal encounter, which they would be able to check the cameras and identify both of our whereabouts that day and could see who truly was off duty for a half an hour. I didn't think much would come of it as I was a relatively new worker and honestly, I didn't care about anything that happened to that place. I let it slip from my mind for the weekend. The next Monday, I come in before most and start setting up. After a while, the general manager comes out of the back with the supervisor following her like a puppy, staring at his feet. He walks sheepishly up to me and invites me to sit with him at one of the tables in the cafeteria where he admits to me that he was in the wrong. Shouldn't have yelled at me like that, should be a better leader, is super duper sorry, all that yada yada. I sat there with the biggest grin on my face as he practically groveled at my feet, begging for forgiveness as his boss watched on. This man that sat so high on his horse for the past six months, I watched on in celebration as he then apologized to each of my coworkers individually. Not but a week later, he was demoted to a backroom cook and I had been given the role of shift supervisor. We never had a problem after that and he was generally an okay guy. I hope he really did learn his lesson and didn't say all those things just to get it over with. Either way, this was the sweetest revenge of my life. I have since quit that job and work for a company with people who actually know how to respect others as individuals, whether their position is below or above their own. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this story as much as I enjoyed watching it happen. Open up for just me and my husband. I'm a food server at a fairly prominent Midwest casino, so I deal with entitled people on the daily. However, as I'm closing up our fine dining restaurant tonight, I just experienced the epitome of entitled. The restaurant I work at stays open an hour later on Fridays and Saturdays, but these particular folks are VIPs of the casino. They are here every single day, so they know our hours. On top of that, they've come here for so long and so often that the casino comps 100% of the food they eat. So, the story. It's about 20 minutes after we close. I still have a table celebrating their anniversary, so they are taking their time. No big deal. But due to this, we are not allowed to close the doors separating the restaurant from the casino. As I'm tending to my table, I look up and see Entitled Lady and her husband, not so Entitled Dude. Entitled Lady walks past the host's stand and starts frantically waving at me. Me, arms full of dishes, so I give a slight nod to acknowledge them and turn to the kitchen to drop off the dishes. I tell my supervisor we have someone up front. Supervisor, how's it going, Entitled Lady? Entitled Lady, great. We would like a table for two, or we can sit at the bar since it's so late. Supervisor, um, you know we close early on weekdays. I can see if another restaurant that's still open has any available seating. Entitled Lady whips out her player's card for the casino. I'm an upgraded member of the casino. I'd like a table for two, please. Supervisor, Entitled Lady, we've already sent the kitchen staff home. There's nobody who can make your food. Entitled Lady points at the only guests in the room. But they're eating. They had a reservation for an hour and a half before we closed, and they politely let us know they would not be ordering dessert when we checked their food. So we sent the kitchen staff home. Entitled lady, brain begins to melt. Not so entitled dude. Babe, we knew it was a long shot. Let's go to the other restaurant before they close. But we spend so much money here. They really can't open up just for us? As I previously mentioned, the casino comps all of their food. They have never spent a dollar in the restaurant, aside from tipping, which they are typically fair at. My supervisor just laughs and takes the player's card from her so she can get the comp transferred to the other restaurant. 
previous owner's permission is not my permission. I live in the country, moved to this house in 2012. It is a protected watershed. We still have to tell people, I don't care if previous owner said you could 30 years ago. You may not hunt doves, deer, and wild turkeys on my property. No, you cannot plant things here. Remove the salt lake. Get that deer blind off my property. No, you may not shoot target practice here. No, you may not pick fruit slash pecans from my tree whenever you want. No, you may not pick my blueberries. No, you may not fish here. No, you may not park here to walk to the fishing hole. I have removed the Salt Lake Station five times. I have dismantled four different deer blinds. I have dismantled a still three separate times. Call the police for that too. I have chased off hunters. I've chased off people who were scrap metal salvaging. In one memorable instance, the previous owner's grandson showed up with a truck full of stuff telling me his grandma said he could move into one of the trailers since she had come by and seen no one was living in it. She told him she was sure we wouldn't mind. This was after she called to ask us and we said no. Not rent, just live there for free. No to both. All of this happens because previous owner still tells people they can hunt, fish, farm. She told our neighbor he could plant in our field before he knew she had moved. This was 2014 or whatever else her brain comes up with. She told her grandsons to just ignore us and keep doing it, that we really didn't mind. What made them stop? Not the no trespassing signs, not us telling them no, not me burning their stuff in a bonfire. Nope, still find those entitled people on my land. The reason I have not confronted them is that I can never actually catch them at it. I find their crap and bonfire it. The times I have heard them, I always go out armed. They done run off. The farmer neighbor was very sorry. I don't blame him. We let him keep what he had planted that year. It wasn't much. He never did it again. We have a good relationship with him and his workers and they are very respectful. A lot of people are suggesting I fence in my property. Few problems with that. I live on 13 acres of heavily wooded land. I am on a fixed income and not able to afford it. I enjoy the wildlife on my property. If I could afford a fence, I wouldn't be able to watch the deer in the mornings and evenings. As far as cameras, I am going to try to save enough out of my very tight budget to get one that I can move between spots. I've been told to get one that does timestamps, waterproof, high pigs, night vision, long battery life. Any suggestions are welcome. Entitled Doctor and a Busy Week Every once in a while, I'm encountering physicians and surgeons who call themselves doctors who, in fact, never earned that title. If you went to med school slash uni and got your MD, PhD, doctor, I'm fine with that and I will call you doctor. But if you didn't earn that title, if you never even considered making the effort of getting it, don't tell me to call you a doctor because you're not. So, on Monday, I ran into a rather entitled surgeon who tried to tell me how to do my job working as a freelance RN right now. When I didn't comply to his ridiculous suggestions, he ended the conversation with, Hey, listen, I'm the doctor here and you'll do what I say. Thursday at lunch, I met into him again and since he noticed that I didn't give a crap about his orders, he went on and got into a marvelous rant. Again, he referred to himself as a doctor. In the meantime, since our last encounter, I looked him up, of course. Turned out he is a medical practitioner and not a doctor of medicine. Ignoring his rant, I casually mentioned to him that if he lied about that, how could I take him or anything he's saying for serious, leaving him standing there with a really red head and an open mouth? Yesterday, my head nurse called me into her office. She heard of the incident from him and he told her to either talk sense into me or get rid of me. That's actually an option, but it takes a lot. She told me to apologize to him and then better to ignore him. He's known for such behavior and as a clerical character. Of course, I didn't apologize, but I promised to ignore him. Today, now, I got summoned again to my head nurse. And guess who was there? That very special surgeon. Turns out, he wrote a formal complaint against me for accusing him of lying in front of his peers and his head of surgery. They sat at the table behind him at lunch, didn't notice at the time. Head nurse tried to moderate, telling both sides to stay calm, but he didn't. Went on and on about how much of an insubordinate I am, etc, etc. He demanded repeatedly that I had to apologize and added the term publicly. Since I was a bit tired of the whole affair and everything said was recorded, there has to be a written protocol when a formal complaint has been made, I agreed. My exact words were, you know what, yes, I promise that I will apologize to you in front of whomever you wish. 
after you produce the appropriate diploma or certification that says you're a doctor, because that's what this whole thing is about. Besides the fact that it would prove me wrong, it would also prove him right. Would be the easiest thing to do. He just went mental. Who I thought I am, that I'm not in the position to make such a demand. He calmed down eventually and then, kind of smug, looked at me, smiling and said, Why should I prove to you I'm a doctor when you yourself aren't one? I think I just sat there for 10 seconds, staring at him like a total idiot. When I realized what he just did, I asked my head nurse to get my dossier and give to him the page with a copy of my PhD certificate. My first time such an entitled jerk got what he deserved. You won't let me use my coupon. I hadn't been in my store in a little under a week due to scheduling and definitely wasn't ready for what happened today. I had a few customers that I see every few days and then this one lady comes along. She starts telling me about how she never seems to get to the store on time to use her coupons and she was excited to get to use one this time. Fair enough. The only problem with this is she only took a screenshot of her email saying she received a coupon but not the actual barcode, to which I told her she could log into the website on her phone and get the reward or she could bring up the email which would have a pop-up for me to get the barcode. Neither of these answers are options she likes and wants to know why it doesn't show up on our system, what coupons she has when we look up her account. I told her that it was out of my control, but I can give her the number for the company's customer service line to give them feedback. She waves it off with a groan and her eyes rolling. So she tries the method of scrolling down her emails instead of using the search function, which annoys the heck out of me, but guess that's a millennial problem. Complaining about how she just saw it and it mysteriously disappeared. I had her check the spam and trash sections of her email with no luck. Sometimes with older customers, we ask if we could just take a look at their phone and see if we can find the email. They usually hand it over like they are happy someone understands technology. I type in my company's name into her email and nothing pops up. So I ask her if she had another email. The same results would pop up. So I remind her that if she logs into the website, there's a section called rewards that will have the barcode there. I don't believe you. It didn't work before, so why would it now? And, so you're telling me that I'm not allowed to use my coupons because I don't have a barcode? Silence and staring. No, without a barcode, I cannot reduce the price of the transaction. It needs to come from your email. She continues to insist that she has a valid coupon and she just saw it, but somehow she can't find it anymore. That she is disappointed in the company about lying to her and how she's on a budget so if she can't find this $5 off coupon, she'll have to leave her $15 transaction behind. There's nothing I can do without a barcode, and there's no amount of, please, I am on a budget, that's going to get me to get a manager to override it for her, especially after being rude to me. I had her give me her phone number to verify that she's searching through the right email inbox, and she continues with ranting about how it was a flawed system, which sometimes I do agree with, but not now. So I decided to try the website option again, we get her phone to load the website while she complains about the store not having Wi-Fi and I ask her to log in. I don't know my password. At this point, my coworker has a line of about eight people and this woman is absolutely nutty about this coupon that only she saw. So I reached over and flipped my light on to signal that they can come to my register because that seems to hurry people along that refuse to leave when they can't get their way. Within a minute of me flipping on my light, she remembers her password and logs into the account finds the coupon, and ta-da! Instead of it being 1567, it's now 1067. As a goodbye, I remind her about the survey, and that's a good place to leave feedback for improvements, and she shuffled out with her purchase without saying anything else. Entitled mom can't have her son eating chicken. Okay, so for setting, this story happened in Mexico, in a town called Sayulita. This also happened fairly recently, during my school spring break during mid-February when we decided to visit Mexico. My dad is super cautious, but my mom wanted us to go. So we went to the safest place we could find. Anyways, on with the story. I was at a small restaurant in Sayulita. I don't remember the name of it, sorry. And I was getting my food and drink. Then this family with their about four-year-old kids sits down next to us. These people clearly are from outside of Mexico, probably America due to their accents. Anyway. I'm super bored and am absent-mindedly just listening to them. It's clear when the waiter is taking their order that they do not speak Spanish and their accents are horrible. The mom is the only one who spoke more than 15 words in Spanish. Anyway, 
The menu is in Spanish, and they are clearly having a hard time with the menu. The translated exchange went something like this, with the bad grammar. Mom. Can I have the chilaquiles, please? Two, please. Waiter, slightly confused. Yes, of course. Anything else? No. So far, nothing was happening, and I was about halfway done with my meal when the waiter came with the food. Now, chilaquiles are a dish typically served with pulled chicken, and this chicken can easily be taken off and put to the side. But when the food comes, this mom just verbally assaults this poor waiter who clearly has no idea what she's saying. At first, the mom tries to say in Spanish something about her being a vegetable and she can't have meat, but she quickly switches to English as it becomes clear that she makes no sense. She basically yelled that she was a vegetarian and her and her son, who probably didn't even choose to be a vegetarian, couldn't have any meat. Instead of taking off the chicken, she throws this food off the table and storms off with the dad and son walking behind. I wish I could say that the manager came and made these people clean up the mess and pay for the food, but all that ended up happening was that the waiter cleaned up the food and went on with their day. Anyway, even though it wasn't about me, an entitled parent is an entitled parent. Karen loses it at the church fair. Here is yet another tale from my volunteering at church. This happened about a year ago. I had to cover three games total until the volunteers that covered the other two showed up. They were all near each other though, so that's a plus. Anyway, I had to cover a dice roll game, a game called Troll Doctor, and sadly, Goldfish Pong. Bit of a side note, if you ever had to deal with managing a goldfish game, then you know how many entitled parents show up. Okay, back to the story. Today was the last day close to closing, so we're packed with kids. I had like five kids waiting on each game, but on Goldfish, I noticed a kid getting antsy, and he started cutting others in line. Now I was told to not let them cut in line as it may upset others, so I kindly asked him to go back to where he was, which he did until he left the line. I thought he was going to get food from the food area, so I was managing my game going well, until Karen came by and this heck ensued. Karen, excuse me. I didn't notice her since she had a little kid and I thought she was talking to the one managing the bouncy castle, so I kept letting them play. But then the entitled mom pushed the game backwards, which was easy since it was on a foldable table, and finally got my attention. Me. Ma'am, please don't do that. You can knock the tank over and kill the fish. I don't care. Why did you tell my baby he can't play? Me. Because he was cutting others in line who wanted to play before him, and we're limited on our supplies. Now stupidly, at this moment, I decided to remove one of the dead fish, and the second I did, I realized I messed up. Why did you hurt that fish in front of me and my baby? He deserves a fish now for compensation before I get my dear friend who runs this place. Her son was smugly smiling at this. Me. First of all, it was dead from when you shook the table. Second of all, what's her name then? Now I'm going to use fake names for this. Debra. Me. No, her name is Susan. That's what I meant. S Susan and I go back to high school. Oh, that's a shame, because her name is actually Madison. Oh, she's also a friend of mine. Now I knew she was trying to lie to me, so I said, Okay, she's over by the food tent. Go talk to her. Fifteen minutes go by. I'm down to about five fish, and kids are just watching them, but they see a dead one, and I told them I'll remove it, but since I remembered Karen, I put it into one of the plastic bags of water. Then Entitled Mom goes by. Madison said I should get a fish for compensation. Now, this being a full-on adult that also teaches at CCD, volunteers are the teachers, who Madison knows I hate, she would always skip over important lessons and just play games. I knew the dead fish was a good plan. Me. Here you go. Thank you. Now was that so hard? Entitled Kid. Yeah, idiot. You should have given us the fish before since Madison is my mommy's BFF. Entitled Mom. Shh. We got your fish. Let's go home. And as far as I know, they didn't realize it was dead until they got home and the festival shut down. Have you ever had any pet fish? If so, what kind were they? Please let me know. My state senator turned out to be an entitled parent. So this is a little strange of a story, but my sister plays rec soccer in the town's league. My dad is the head coach, and I, three years older than my sister, am listed as an assistant coach. I needed to do it so I could get my coach's license. People, we've got me, we've got my dad, he's a normal guy. We've got entitled parent, 
We've got entitled parents kid who's not entitled. We've got my sister and we've got the other normal coach. So this guy was a state senator in my state for about 20 years until he was unseated by a close family friend. My sister and his daughter were on the same rec soccer team. His daughter is a good player, but doesn't really understand the game. Most of the season, Entitled Parent doesn't really show up to practices and games. I'm a soccer player, but I've been out injured for my entire season. I had gone to every single practice and game except for occasional times my PT conflicted. The kids on my team like me, and they all call Entitled Parent the coach who can't coach. In the playoffs, the semifinal I think, we were getting ready to play, and I was talking to a few of the kids on the team about the game plan. I was telling them what my dad had told me to say because I had the tactics board. Entitled Parent doesn't like this. He thinks I'm trying to get them to play the way I want them to play, which is the way we normally play, and not his terrible method of playing which cost us a game when I wasn't there. Entitled Parent confronts Dad about it, telling him that I shouldn't be doing that even though I was told to do that by my dad. Midway through the first half, I'm watching from the bench and it's 0-0. I notice that the other team has one defender just hanging back in the box, which would keep our forwards onside, and I go to my dad and tell him that we should try and exploit that as best we can. Me. Dad, look, they have a player in the box. Can you call Entitled Parents get over so I can point it out to her? Dad. Yes. Yells out to Entitled Parents kid to come over. Me. Hey. So you notice that the other team has a defender in the box. Try and use her keeping you on side to your advantage. And she knows what I'm saying and she goes forward and does it. Entitled parent to my dad. Why is Google Snake Game talking to my daughter and stopping our best player, which she wasn't, from being in the action in the playoffs? Dad to entitled parent. I told him to do that. Back off. He's also a coach. Entitled parent to me. Why would you do that? Me. Because I want us to win? Entitled Parent Clearly you don't if you're telling our best player nonsense during the middle of the game, you useless moron. Other coach to my dad. Hey, Entitled Parent is harassing your kid, man. Dad to me. What is he saying to you? Me. He called me a useless moron and scolded me for doing what you told me to do, even though we're at the same level. At this point, Entitled Parent's kid had been substituted for my sister and Entitled Parent just lost it. He got up in my face. I'm a big dude, bigger than him, saying how not only did I waste time, I also nepotized by putting a crappy player, my sister who can hold her own but isn't a standout player or anything, on for Entitled Parent's kid, the best player on the team. He shoved me and the two wrong people noticed, my dad and the director of the league, whom the other coach had notified of Entitled Parent yelling at me. I'm about 30 years younger than this dude but he's screaming in my face and pushing me. So my dad comes over and gets right up in Entitled Parent's face. Dad, I swear Entitled Parent, don't ever talk to my kid like that ever again. That's not okay. He's my kid, he's 14. You can't be talking to him like that. Entitled Parent, I don't care whose kid he is, he did something disrespectful to me and he needs to be made aware that he disrespected me. Me, you're kidding, right? Dad, shut up Entitled Parent, he was doing what I told him to do. You're on the same level as him. You have no authority over either him or me. My son was doing the right thing and did not in any way disrespect you. Entitled Parent He needs to leave. He's not allowed to disrespect me like that. If he continues to do that, I will have to get him removed. At this point, the league director has come over. He tells Entitled Parent that he needs to stop, which honestly sets him off even more, and that I did nothing wrong, and that he saw the whole thing. Entitled parents spat at me, demanded I apologize to him, and shoved me again. At this point, the game had been stopped. All of our coaches and their coaches, the referee and the league director are involved. Entitled parent is being insane. Me and my dad are livid. I have idiots spit on my cheek. I grab a tissue from the box on the bench and use it to wipe it off. The referee gives entitled parent a red card, tells him to leave, which causes him to lose it. He attempts to pull the team off the field, but my dad cuts him off and says no way. Aftermath Entitled Parent is permanently banned from our town league, from the state soccer organization, and from coming to any of the games. We won the game and the championship, and my sister scored the winning goal. Have you ever played any sports? If so, which ones? I'd really love to know. Chill, Karen. It's just milk. 
So this happened a little over a year ago when I was still new to working at my job as a courtesy clerk, someone who bags groceries, cleans messes, does go backs, etc, etc. It was late at night and the store was near its closing time. As a result, there weren't that many people in the other lines and none in mine. So me and my cashier coworker, let's call her Annie, were waiting for customers to come to our line whenever. Eventually, a woman comes to our line and places her gallon of milk onto the conveyor belt. Annie gives her the general greetings of good afternoon and will that be all? Something about this lady's demeanor sort of put me on edge initially. It may have been her face at the time. She looked really upset about something but seemed like she was trying to bite it back to buy her milk. Her total came up to a certain amount and she was a few coins short. She glared at Annie for a second before saying, For real? And then she turned and walked away from the register without another word. We weren't exactly sure what she intended to do, so Annie asked me to put the milk into the cooler, which was only a few feet away. A few minutes after I had done that, the lady came back into the store and walked briskly back to our lane. She looked around and then glared at Annie again. You put my milk back? She snapped in a really upset tone. I can go get it, I said before I quickly walked back to the cooler to get her milk. As I was coming back, I noticed the tension was starting to rise between this lady and Annie. The lady was growling at Annie under her breath, calling her all sorts of names. But here's one thing about Annie. Annie is a really nice lady. She's a real joy to work with. But when she gets upset, you'll know. And if she's mad, oh boy. So here I am, my head going back and forth like I'm watching a tennis match. As these two are tossing insults back and forth, it quickly became more and more heated. Annie finally counts out the change and hands it to the lady. And of course, she takes the money and leaves as to not cause a bigger scene, right? Wrong. The lady balls her fist and chucks the change right into my coworker's face. Annie was mad. I really thought she was going to jump over the counter and deck this jerk in the face. Anybody who was at the front were all in shock as the two yelled at each other. This continued until the lady turned and just left as quickly as she came. A few minutes go by and our security guard at the time comes back up to the front. What happened? He asked, looking around at everyone. Everyone whipped their heads around to him. Where were you? I was still on break. I have tons more stories from my time here at the store, so just let me know if you want more. Thanks for reading. Grumpy construction contractor yells at me cause he be trippin. So I work a job as a service technician and I went to a new building that needed some warranty work done. It had been officially handed over to the owners, which is a hotel. The contractors were still running about doing deficiencies and odds and ends, but the hotel staff was on site, training and such. I used to work for construction companies all the time and I hated it because of the semantics of it all. They would be a stickler for rules inside the property at all times, but when it suited them, they would bend the rules. I hate that. Anyhow, this building had a door close to where I was working and I propped it open to go to my truck, maybe 20 feet from the door itself, a 5 second walk. First contractor, head honcho on site, comes out and sees me on the phone out there and asks if I propped the door open. The thing is, there was another door propped open just on the other end of the hallway, but it led to a loading bay away from the street. It was okay to have that one open because there was a worker there. Semantics. I said, yes, just loading tools right now, but I don't want to walk all the way around the building as I have a lot of tools to bring in. This guy was reasonable and he said, sure son, not a problem, just please remember to close the door. We don't want a hooligan coming in and stealing a TV or something. Alright, no problem, I can do this for you. Told him I'm not just a laborer who have the reputation for not being the smartest of people, but I'm a decently smart technician in a complicated trade. He laughs and goes alright, that makes me feel better. Plus, he called me son, so that was nice. He says, Alright, as long as you're inside of that door and you aren't walking away, you can prop it open. Cut to maybe 10 minutes later and I'm on the phone outside, no reception in the building, in clear view of the door and his sidekick foreman guy is there. Young dude, small tiny guy, who tried hard to compensate. I could hear the way he was talking to his employees, the dude's a jerk. I come inside as he's walking towards me and goes, Hey! Don't prop that door open. Got it? I had time today. I don't like being yelled at. So I simply said, I'm right here. Don't worry. No one's getting in. Spoke with your boss. He said it's cool. He stops, all bewildered and such, and responds with, 
do not open that door again. I asked him why he was yelling and he goes, Hey, you listen to me when you're on this site. Do you understand? I'm the boss and I don't want you questioning me again. This is where I goofed. I wasn't wearing my company shirt because it was hot in the room I was working in. It was a crawl space above a kitchen, just had on a t-shirt. I simply looked at the guy and said, A. Don't yell at me or speak to me like that again. B. I'm here on behest of my owners. I do not work for you guys in any shape or form. If you have a problem with me, go run to your boss or go to the owners and go tattle on me. He stopped and tried to say something, but you know when you've got someone dead to rights and they kind of just try to say something? Exactly this. This guy didn't know what to do at all. He eventually just walked away and I chuckled to myself. That was a great feeling. When you don't answer to someone, when you don't represent the company to them, they can't say anything to you. You're working for the owners directly and it's not going to reflect negatively on your company to say, hey, don't yell at me. Karen makes me hold the door open for her. So here's the deal. It's 30 to close. I'm the only one here and I'm doing my closing routine. We're in a big city near a huge college campus, but it's a Sunday night, so we're slow. We keep quite a few signs out in front of the shop and they have huge weighted bricks to hold them down during strong winds. So needless to say, closing kind of sucks since you're forced to do a mini workout, but whatever. So I'm carrying these bricks in a few at a time because they're super heavy with no real handles on them. I also try to grab some of the tarps that go with the signs to make it in as few trips as possible. While I'm doing this, there's this girl that pulls up on a bike and kind of just stands at the entrance to the store. We're in a big city, so people tend to stop by often without really coming in. So I have no idea what her plan is or what she wants. As I'm about to walk in with my arms very obviously full, she looks at me and goes, Excuse me, do you work here? Me, literally standing there with a company logo t-shirt on, lanyard, weights, company sign and all. Yes, I do. Is there something I could help you with? Well, what a dumb question that was, because this girl literally looks at me, arms full, carrying weights, and says, I really dislike that these doors are not automatic. How am I supposed to get in with my bike? They're not even ADA acceptable. How would someone with a wheelchair even get in? I'm standing there, trying to wrap my mind around how someone in a wheelchair is capable of using their arms to open a door when I notice she's looking at me like I'm the idiot. She then asks me to hold open the door for her. It might sound like not that big of a deal or that ridiculous of a request, but here's the thing. This girl can clearly see that my arms are completely full and I had no issues opening the door for myself. I can't even imagine having nothing in my arms and asking someone else to open a door for me simply because I'm upset that it's not automatic. She literally watched me struggle to open the door, then walked right in. Some might think this story ends here, but it does not. We both get inside, no thanks to her, and she proceeds to tell me how much she hates our doors. She tried listing out all the different kinds of people who might not be able to open our doors. Keep in mind, these are just regular doors, not some kind of magical doors that are impossible to open. Nope, just regular old doors, with a simple handle. According to Brittany, people in wheelchairs, short people, so short they can't open a door, people with disabilities, people with no arms, etc. Her list was absolutely ridiculous and honestly a little offensive. She seemed upset that I wasn't fixing it or had an answer of when it would be fixed. This girl wants automatic doors tonight. I told her I would pass it along the chain and then proceeded to hide in the back so she would at least have to open her own door when leaving. It's not that big of a deal, but it feels good to vent about it. Open your own doors, people. I obviously would go out of my way to help anyone that's in need, but some people really like to take advantage of other people's kindness. Before I get any judgment, I wanted to add that she had no issues riding her bike, lifting heavy items in the store, etc. I know not all disabilities are visible, but truly she opened the door just fine when she left on her own. Also, I only mention that she's a college student because a lot of the students on campus come from really wealthy families. I go to a state school nearby, but I don't feel like it changes anything. Entitled Grandma thinks I should ruin my weekend and stay at her place. Just for context, my grandma was raised in a Latin American, upper class, white military, officer class family. So this means entitlement was part of her upbringing. She emigrated with my aunt to my country shortly after divorcing my grandpa and managed to make a life by herself. 
My dad came some years later. After several years, she started her own business with my dad. She's quite careless with money, and despite having worked for most of her life, and certainly all of her life here due to ill advice, she is not entitled to any kind of pension as she decided not to pay her social security contributions. So her savings came to an end shortly after retiring and basically my dad covers her expenses and many of her family arguments are about money. Also due to her entitlement and ill character, she has alienated most of her acquaintances and a big part of her family. I do actually feel pity for her. Well, now to the first of various stories of her many entitled tantrums directed at me. This happened several years ago. I was 27 and had just moved out of my parents and was living with one of my best friends. It was a Friday afternoon and I was waiting for my roomie to come from work. He was on afternoon shift that week and we had made plans for that night. Suddenly, I see that my grandma calls. The conversation goes as follows. Me. Hi grandma, what do you want? Entitled grandma. I need you. I'm in great distress. There's nobody at my place. She was living with my aunt then. Everyone is out for the weekend, and the housemaid has the full weekend off. I'm alone and frightened. Come stay with me at my place. Me. Nope, I'm not doing that. It's a Friday. I have plans for the night. Tomorrow I have to go shopping for things for my new place. The kind of things I couldn't do if I went to your place. Entitled Grandma, wailing. But I'm alone. I'm scared to death of being alone. You have to come. Me. No, I don't have to. I have plans for the weekend. The kind of plans a young man has. Also, I love being alone and would like to be it as much time as possible. It is actually one of my favorite activities and I don't like to stay at other people's places. But you are the nice one. You have to come. I'm alone. I'm scared. I'll pay for you. Me scoffs. Do you know I have a job? Well, tell your friends if they want to come, I'll pay for them. Me. What the heck? Are you nuts? My friends have their careers, and none of them is being at your service. And if they did, you'll be so horrible to them that they'll stop being my friends. Don't be a jerk. Come, or I'll tell your dad. No, I'm not going. It's final. Don't ever try that on me again. She must have called my dad, as some minutes later my dad called. Dad. Entitled Grandma called and told me her nonsense story. I told her you are in no way obliged to go to her house. But you must excuse her, she has barely slept alone in her house and she doesn't like it. Me. Yeah, I know, but she has to live with it, and don't torment us with it. Did she also tell you the rest of the story? Nope, what happened? She tried to offer me money for staying with her. Dad, laughing. What? Really? I can't believe she tried to pull a teenager's trick on you. Gets better. Then she offered money for one of my friends to go over. Dad, laughing even more. Well, that's my mom. Anyways, coming home on Sunday for lunch? Me. Yep, buy something nice to eat. Dad. See you then. Just cancel my appointment. I work in a call center for a grouping of five hospitals. I physically work in one of the hospitals, but give medical appointments for all of them. There are more than a dozen doctors in the department, so the system we use contains a lot of patients. I get a lot of rude people, and I understand that's because they are anxious about their health, but some of them are unbearable. This happened a few months ago. I answer a call and I can see from the start that a Karen is on the line. Me. Hi, how can I help you? Karen. Hi, I have a medical appointment with Dr. M and I'd like to cancel it. Me. Sure. May I have your health card number or the number of any of our hospital's cards? That won't be necessary. I just want to cancel my appointment. It's on the date at this time. Me. Unfortunately, I need one of those numbers to access your medical file. Then I'll be able to cancel. Just enter my name. It's Karen McCarran. As I said, I will still need the number of one of your cards. Use my name. It's K-A-R-E-N. I do know how to spell it, but I cannot find your medical file with just your name. By that time, I can see that there are 20 plus persons waiting to get answered, and the person who's been waiting for the longest time has been on for 20 minutes. The calls are usually long from 5 to 9 minutes because we need to give a lot of information about the preparation regarding the appointment. Karen What do you mean you can't find my file? I go to this hospital all the time. If you just give me the number of one of your cards, I'll be able to find your file quite easily. Just cancel my appointment. Ma'am, if you do not want to give me your hospital card number, then I won't be able to help. I've got other patients waiting to be answered. We can hang up but know that your medical appointment will still be scheduled in our system. But I want it cancelled. 
I understand that, but I cannot access your file to do that. Would you like to finish this call? Thing is, I can't hang up on someone mid-call unless they are insulting or screaming at me. So I just start doing some small tasks while I wait for her to make a decision. Finally, I hear huffing and puffing and lots of noises, like the whole content of a purse being dumped on a table. Ugh! She gives me her card number. I accessed her medical file and canceled her appointment. Your appointment with Dr. M is canceled. Well, that wasn't so hard. You should have told me all you needed was my card number. I was internally screaming so hard by that point that I just hung up before telling her to have a good day. From her medical file, I saw that she didn't have any compensation problem and she didn't have an accent to make me think she didn't understand what I was saying. Just a plain entitled Karen. It was not the first patient who refused to give me their card number. A man called us back and wanted to know why we called him, but wouldn't give me the number so I couldn't access his file to tell him. People are that stupid. Entitled Parent tries to force me to put her brat in my movie. Context. I am an editor. I have a degree in editing and directing. I make movies. Pretty simple to understand. Now, what you probably also gathered is that I am not anywhere close to famous and that the movies I work on are mostly my own. Many documentaries and corporate videos to pay the bills and short films. Never anything feature length or using crews larger than a dozen people or expecting hundreds of thousands to even see our stuff. And that is where this comes in. I am editing a video for someone else, pro bono. Don't ever tell people you do this. I am doing it in public, which this is only the second time outside of college I have ever done this, and was only done because my roommate also needed to study for a test and our power was out for some city scheduled thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't be at a cafe since I dislike coffee. He needed a book and a light, and I needed an outlet, so we sat far away from each other in this place. Oh well, not really a thing to worry about. Well, this is a high traffic part of town and popular to boot, so the likelihood I see someone I might know isn't too low, and lo and behold, entitled parent and entitled kid. Gonna keep some identifying details vague from here on, including small dialogue changes. So in walks our entitled parent. They are walking in tow with their daughter, maybe 14 or 15. Now, I know this entitled parent through another family member who knows everyone, but I've only met them twice. Once was just a minor introduction, along with about a dozen others, and the only time we spoke beyond that was when I was trying out with freelance and generic getting to know each other conversation at a huge family and friends event. My relative tends to be very energetic and hyperbolic and talks everything up enthusiastically. You probably know the type. So chances are, in an effort to brag on my behalf, probably told them I am the best editor this side of Hollywood. They see me long before I see them and I'm just trying to sync a section of video to some music to be in rhythm and putting far too much energy and concentration into this 32 frame section of video. I get startled when suddenly they're both in front of me saying hi. I say it back, shocked at the social interaction I know I have to deal with. I'm not a social butterfly. Entitled Parent Hi Krieg, it's good to see you after so long. Me. Whoa, uh, hey. Well, this is fairly unexpected. What brings you here? I thought you lived up north. Just got done visiting your relative to get them to help me with my yard. Me. Oh, gotcha. To Entitled Kid. Hey, I'm Krieg by the way. I'm Entitled Kid. Yes, sorry, this is my daughter. She's in theater and doing a play outside of school down here. Me. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I was not in theater, but some of my friends were way back in high school. Entitled Parent. Honey, he makes movies now. I'm halfway between embarrassed that I'm dealing with a teenager and having an entitled parent talk about me and trying to fight back the massive ego boost that now wants to talk their ear off about movies. I don't talk much unless I get excitable, which I'm trying to avoid. Me. Oh, Noah's exhale. Yeah, I do on occasion when I'm lucky. I am working on one right now, trying to get the cuts and actions to sync up with the music in the scene. Entitled Parent Oh, really? A music video? Me Oh no, a fight scene in a drama. I'm just going too far with the editing because a long time ago my last editing mentor told me I was more intuitive with editing, not just on beat, but in rhythm with music and said it's kind of one of my specialties, and I kind of took that notion a little too far. So now I'm editing this scene a little too much if that makes sense. But it's easier to remove than to add. Besides, you can almost make the actions of the actors look better and more rehearsed, like a flow from a play or a dance, if you cut in good pacing with music. 
the scene becomes its own beast as long as it doesn't stand out too much stylistically from the rest of the movie. Entitled Kid's eyes are wide open and locked on me, but maybe not in an enamored way. Possibly in the, geez, I wasn't expecting that kind of way. Entitled Parent is just grinning and laughs a little and asks to sit down. I say sure and scoot my computer closer to me. Entitled Parent So, I actually have something to ask you since I've trapped you here. Me Shoot. Entitled Parent I want you to put Entitled Kid in one of your movies. Me Shocked exhale. Oh, yeah? Um, I stall since I've always imagined the scenario of people asking to be in my movie either as an entitled jerk or begging and I always figured how I would approach it depending on whether they were strangers or close friends or family. But now that it is someone I kinda know, and since those were all fantasy arguments, I am at a total loss as to how I can say no. I mean, part of me also thought to humor them, but I also just wanted to not put in the effort and stress and say no. I know, I know, everyone wants to be in a big Hollywood film, but I am not gonna beg to put them in. Me. Oh yeah, thanks. I know you don't make big movies just yet, but you know that she is an actual actress and even got parts in an outside play, so you don't exactly have to fret. Well, I mean, the actors we use these days are all from a website where we put up audition notices, and even ones we've used before, we make audition again because the roles are all different, and I can't force the director to choose someone. I thought you made the movies. I do make the movies. I am the editor. I literally make them. Entitled Kid I was told you made real movies, like the director. Honey, let me handle this. Me Handle what? I just want her in whatever you make next, even if it's small or her part is small, just so she can get some exposure. You can pay her in that exposure even. Me Well, exposure is never a good payment in this industry. Again, never tell when you do free favors. But that won't even matter. This movie is only going to be seen by a few thousand at most if it gets into a film festival or it gets some online traffic. Entitled Parent Your relative said you did bigger stuff. They were just exaggerating. Also, did they actually say big stuff or did you just interpret that? Cause big for me is how well received a video is, not it being literally a two hour high budget film. Entitled Kid Oh, so you lied. You aren't even some big filmmaker. Me I'm sorry that you thought that, but I do make movies. Entitled Parent, sounding disappointed. Well then, you'll just have to put her in the one you think is going to be the one going to film festivals. Me. Excuse me? I'm sorry, but I just said I am the editor. I work after all that stuff is decided and filmed. Did you lie to your relative? No, I... Ugh. Sorry, trying to keep my cool here. I didn't. I do direct to... But I get more work as an editor, which frankly I am more skilled at. I didn't expect such an ego on you. What ego? To admit I'm better at being an editor versus a director, which is more prestigious? I'm sorry, but I actually do need to finish this movie. Entitled Kid Hey, I thought you heard my mom. Just put me in. I can act. I don't see why it's such a big deal. Me I'm sorry, but she'd have to audition just like everyone else, and I'm usually attached to stuff with older actors anyway, and you're just a little too young. Entitled Parent I guess that's that. I am sorry you can't see that potential in her. This could have helped both of you. Me You know what, Entitled Parent? I don't do favors. Hypocrite You are the very first person to ever ask me to put someone in a movie, and I quiet down because I was about to cause a scene. I really didn't know how to handle this. What did you expect me to do? Get her apart over someone else for a 5 minute video? Or worse, a 20 minute serious short film where the director suddenly doesn't get to direct his movie properly? Entitled Parent Then put her in one of yours! I'm sorry, but I will not be spoken down to. Please leave me alone. You are now interrupting my work. Entitled Kid Oh, now we're interrupting? What I really wanted to say was, you don't know me, and I certainly don't owe you or your little brat. But instead, I just grunted in the affirmative. Let's go. Clearly, he's not going to give you a shot. Entitled Kid We're better off, as if he thinks he's going to be big. They get up to leave. Me Wait, were you going to ask me this anyway and just got lucky seeing me here? It would have been a favor to you as much as to us. 
but we can't deal with your unprofessional attitude. Me. You know, I made my relatives promo. They know about my professionalism, so don't pretend that it's my fault she isn't gonna break into movies. Just let this go. I don't want you affecting my relationship with my relative. Have a good day. Through gritted teeth. They left. My roommate was none the wiser. The people next to us gave me odd looks later, as I'm sure they began eavesdropping somewhere along the way. And I got a little vindication that I told them off, I guess. But it doesn't end there. My relative got word of it about a week later and apologized to me and promised to take me out to a fancy dinner with some people to make film connections with. That still hasn't happened because I think I'm his film guy. But it's cool because they exaggerate and at least meant well. But I heard through the grapevine that my relative decided the work they helped with would be full price rather than at a discounted cost, which is the little revenge we can exact while still being cordial. So I'll take it. Also, the entitled kids play? Well, we decided a spur of the moment barbecue so we couldn't attend was also necessary. So now I'll never know what the acting prodigy I just said no to can do. Have you ever acted in a play or a movie or anything like that? If so, please let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Keep leaving all of the work to your group members? This teacher is tired of your crap. Backstory. I've been teaching for many years, but it's important to understand that in my first year of teaching, I got put on blast by an elite group of entitled parents and their entitled kids. Not a week went by without someone either demanding my job, trying to undermine me, or just calling me a piece of crap. I nearly quit halfway through the first semester. It just got so bad. This was at a school in a tough area, so I was accused of being unfair constantly for asking kids to stop talking, was ripped into for giving failing grades for missing work, and even enforcing the rules in the student slash parent handbook got me in hot water. My principal reprimanded me for being a negative influence on the school, and I was told that I needed to let more rules slide because he was tired of hearing from parents. I would have parents just show up unannounced to sit in on my lessons and then tell me I was a bad educator, a bad human being, etc. I have plenty of horror stories from that school alone, but the point I want to make is that this experience defined the kind of teacher I became going forward to my next school. I needed to be that person who was untouchable because I needed to focus on the one job that mattered, teaching kids. My next school was in a fairly affluent area. It wasn't uncommon for me to find that my students' parents made millions, which brought its own unique set of problems. However, my new principal was super supportive of me as long as I followed the school's handbook to the letter because by doing so, I was in line with the school's philosophy and protected by law. We seriously had parents filing frivolous lawsuits all the time. This school had long ago learned that caving to parents' demands spilled blood in the water and brought the rest of the sharks in droves. My first year at this new school was successful for many reasons, but primarily because the school culture was easily adapted to. By planning ahead, I was able to head off 99% of all negative parents at the pass. The few times a parent tried to rip into me at conferences, I ripped back so hard that I developed a reputation among the kids and parents as someone you couldn't mess with. Everything I did was in line with the rules, and any attempt to take me down got stonewalled by my principal, who would have to say, Mr. Fighter Jet is following school policy, so I'm afraid the ultimate decision is his. No joke, I had some parents in tears because their kid could no longer get an A in my class. I wasn't the teacher who wanted to destroy the students, I just wanted them to be accountable, and sometimes that meant letting them fail. Needless to say, this job became a lot of fun, because instead of waiting to be ambushed by parents, I could work on making my class fun for my students while still teaching them something. I made ironclad rules for the classroom that broke little argument and would adapt the following year to make it harder for students or parents to ruin my day. I have many stories like this, but this is one of my favorites. The backstory. The year this happened, I taught a high school class with grades 9 through 12. That's 14 through 18 year olds for you overseas guests. My class wasn't necessary to graduate, but did count as a core requirement. One of my beginning of the year rules was, I never want to hear, when will we ever need this? Because you didn't have to sign up for this class. How I structure my class is that I try to make students accountable for their own actions. My class was built so that it had something to offer everybody. If you tried your best, you were guaranteed a C. If you worked really hard, you could get a B or an A. I would bust my butt to help a student with any reasonable request. 
The best example of this was a student that was working hard on an assignment and said, I think I understand it now, but can't turn it in on time. To which I answered, then turn it in tomorrow for full credit. This is how hard work pays off. Other than a few hard deadlines in my class, I would do whatever it took to see you learn the material. Mess around in my class? I've already found ways to run circles around your pathetic excuses you throw at your parents for your poor performance. It sounds callous, but I was the teacher who would stay for 90 minutes after school to help you catch up, to help fix your project for another class, or even to listen to you cry about your parents' divorce. If I caught you goofing in class instead of doing your work, my rule was that at least 70% of class time was intended for homework, quizzes, etc. I would warn you a couple times, email your parents, and then wait and see if they even gave a crap. If they didn't, I would let you keep digging that hole until you were hip deep in water and begging for a ladder. And then I would toss you a rope instead. You could still climb it if you tried hard enough, but a lot of students would just cry until that hole caved in and buried them. I also utilized my school's online grading slash assignment system for nearly all of my assignments, which meant I could document when a student looked at the assignment, how long it took them, etc. All of this allowed me to see what my students were doing and when they did it, and also if they were plagiarizing. This was one of the tools that helped me make important decisions about leniency, and also allowed me to say things at conferences such as, of course the test was hard. Your kid didn't attempt the nine homework assignments until 11 p.m. the night before the test. Being able to prove that a student wasn't trying made it impossible for blame to be laid unfairly at my feet. It also meant the worst kids avoided my class. Bonus. However, this year something magical happened. Every other year, I would get a wave of kids who just wanted to mess around and blame everyone else for doing poorly. At the end of the year, students would talk crap about me my class sizes would drop the following year, then I would receive high praise from those students, so everyone would sign up, so on and so on. But this year, not only did I get a giant wave of knuckleheads, but they came with parents who loved to make trouble. I had already heard tales of some of these parents. Other teachers were just dying to hear stories about our interactions because these parents were very much entitled. They would name drop lawyers when they didn't get their way, try to badger teachers into giving their kids extra credit and would largely deny any wrongdoings on their kids' part. These were the parents who would get called in because their student was busted cheating then accused the teacher of making the class too hard, therefore validating their student's need to cheat. So, about these knuckleheads. It was a group of roughly seven senior boys who all shifted their schedules to be in the same period with each other. The other teachers could not believe that I had all of them at the same time, but I just shrugged it off. Every week, the staff lounge was dying to know how I dealt with their shenanigans, but for the most part, I had shut down most of their crap from day one. I actually got along very well with them, despite their constant goofing, because they had mastered the ability to appear busy and didn't distract my other kids. Then came the first group project. My class size was just right for seven groups of four to form. The idiot collective formed two groups of four by pulling in a kid who had been absent on the first day of the project. These two groups crashed and burned on this project super hard for several reasons, but the biggest reasons were that A. They messed around during class time, and B. Put off a two-week assignment until the weekend before and then dumped all the work on everybody else, which resulted in everyone doing minimal effort. I handed out the bad grades and was immediately pulled into parent conferences with several of them, one at a time obviously. Every meeting was the same. My kid did all the work so he doesn't deserve a bad grade. Or, my kid didn't understand the assignment, to which I handed over my hyper-specific rubric, which is a checklist for how I grade things. I never wanted to be accused of grading based on not liking someone. These largely went like this. My kid did all the work, and I don't think it's fair it should hurt his grade. Me. Here is the work your student turned in. Hands it over. Here is my rubric, which I printed and emailed to your student the day the project started. Hands it over. As you can see, I have itemized the grading for ease of use. I would be happy to go over the grade your student earned. Entitled parent, reads through all the evidence, looks at kid. Where are the missing parts? Student. Uh, my group members were responsible for that. Me. I can't grade what I never received, so I can't reasonably just raise your kid's grade. Sorry. Now, good news for all my students. I make assignments worth more throughout the semester with the idea that kids who mess up early can make up for it later by working hard. I seed extra credit throughout the semester and all of these parents are disgruntled. 
but happy to hear that their entitled embryo can still get an A in my class. Now, the end result of these meetings was that it clearly wasn't my fault. Remember, I had all this data to prove that I made every effort to contact everybody, etc. So it must be the other kid's fault. So these parents all decide that their perfect angel is no longer allowed to work with their previous group mates. Like a cancer, this failure of friends distributes through the rest of the class. Like the genius that I am, I make my students write a group contract for every project that details who does what and when it is due. Why is this important? Because the contract provides me the documentation necessary to allow me to dismiss a bad group member and give them a zero without their parent ruining my day. So here is where the problem begins manifesting. These seniors begin bouncing from group to group like cancerous ping pong balls, wreaking havoc. I let students choose their groups, so these seniors are desperately integrating with anybody that will have them. Because of my class size, every group has at least one coddled kid to deal with. And these kids just end up rotating until all of my students have worked with one of these seniors at some point. Now, I'm getting constant complaints from parents of other kids about these boys. Their kid wanted a good grade, which means they ended up doing all the work while the senior lacked. This is usually after the fact, at which time I bring up, I would love to yank that leech out of your grade pool, but you have to use the contract. Students don't want to say anything because they fear retribution from the seniors, but I can't do anything because I will be accused of harassment. The contract can provide me with the leverage I need to prove that these kids were doing no work because these seniors have been playing their parents for years. I make my class utilize Google Docs because the changes are time stamped. No joke, I've had students produce all the work the morning of a parent meeting to try and lie their way out and make me look like a jerk, but that time stamp is a godsend. Luckily, my class is balanced. A crappy group mate can make things hard but not undoable, and parents are appeased that I have an out for their student, but disappointed that their kid doesn't use it. Every time I announce a group project is on the way, some of these seniors sucker up to the other kids to the point that it's expected that a spot will be made for them. I'm talking buying kids lunch, bringing them gifts, etc. Seriously, the day before a group project starts, all of the seniors now sit at separate tables from each other so that they could all pull the I'm already here, let's be in a group card which works most of the time. The strain on class morale is difficult, but I am biding my time. The other students are grabbing at extra credit opportunities constantly so that their grade can absorb the blow. And parent complaints are completely mitigated because I am still offering every chance for success. My principal has a copy of my syllabus in his computer so that he can quote student policies that the parent signed off on. Not uncommon for him to hear, I don't read that crap, so it doesn't apply. But he reminds them that the clause above the signature line says, My signature denotes that I have read this document in its entirety and agree to abide by all the rules, or something similar, and that this should be a lesson to the parent and the student that when you sign something, you should read the fine print. If you ever become a teacher, find an awesome boss like this and stick by their side. The Setup So I have seven slothful seniors, but I shall name the worst of these Larry, Curly, and Mo. The fallout affects all of them, but these are the ones whose parents love to make the most trouble. Every time they bully a teacher into compliance, I imagine they sit around a smoking room with cigars and cognac, laughing at how they got their way yet again with a lowly teacher. I know that anything I do will be heavily scrutinized once the grades start failing, and I need to be able to shrug it off because I have other things to do, and I refuse to be the smiling topic of discussion in their circle. However, a special note about Larry, since he turned 18, his parents now travel non-stop and are impossible to reach. Larry is now just a huge jerk because his parents no longer care about what he does. I closely monitor their grades in my class, but also in others. This may sound sketchy, but I routinely do this with any of my students who struggle with the material so that I can identify if the issue is my class or all of their classes. Students have been known to fake their grades using inspect element, and I got tired of hearing, but they have A's in their other classes, because then I look like the jerk. Anyway, after a check, I speak with the other teachers. It isn't hard to find out that these boys are doing minimal work in other classes, and I actually discover that Larry has been finding ways to get other kids to do the work for him and then disseminating it among his friends. Other teachers have been bullied into lowering test percentages in their class, and guess what? He and his friends are enrolled in these classes. Despite bombing these classes, Homework and project grades give them a comfortable cushion so that most of them are floating at low Bs. I can't prove this. They are using Snapchat. 
but when I bring it up with their teachers, the teachers don't feel like trying to prove it and duke it out with the parents. Now, they are gaming other classes for minimal effort. However, their only recourse in my class is to keep rotating through groups and leeching off of their hard work to maintain C's and B's, and the other kids are too nervous to utilize the group contract to get them fired. However, remember how I mentioned that I steadily increase the value of my assignments to keep kids working and give them a chance to fix their grades? Me, random day in class. Hey everybody, I was looking in the schedule and realized that your last project before finals may stress you out unnecessarily. Would anybody mind if I dropped it? My class, tired of getting banged on group assignments. Nope, drop it, best teacher ever. Me, okay. Well, just so you know, I'm going to move our next project back a couple of weeks and extend the deadline by a week. Also, since I canceled the last project, this means that the next project will now be worth roughly 20% of your final grade, so do your best. Messing this up could hurt your grade. My class. Whatever. JPEG. So in one step, I have inflated this assignment and also moved it. I send out an email to parents and students letting them know about the change to the syllabus and the assignment get no responses other than happiness that I am removing stress from the end of the semester, etc. I actually did this primarily because another teacher, who was a huge jerk, plunked down a monster project that same week and I knew it would burn out my students prior to finals, so figured a break was in order. Win-win for me, really. Now, why did I move it? Maniacallaughter.mp4 The Friday before the project started, I announced at the start of class, Okay, I am introducing the project now so that you can get into groups today and we can do it first thing Monday morning without delay, since this project is so important. This announcement elicits a room full of crap-eating grins. Why? It was senior ditch day. Our school didn't condone a ditch day, so the kids tried their best to keep it a secret, but I found out a month in advance. All seven of these kids were absent from class, which meant that I had just given the entire room freedom from these deadweights. Immediately, groups are formed, and even better, I had a couple kids transfer out of my class that semester, which meant, number-wise, these knuckleheads will have to work on this last group project together, in two groups. I emphasized that everyone needed to get to class as soon as possible so that they could start as soon as attendance was called. My original intention was to light a giant fire under all seven of these chumps to get them to actually put in the effort they had neglected to do all year. Most of them had grades in the low C range, except for one in the low Bs. As a bonus to all my students, I put an extra credit portion on this project so that they could recoup their early semester losses, but also allow these seniors to do very well if they put in the effort. This wasn't meant to be a revenge tale, but an attempt to give them one last lesson in responsibility. Before the end of the day, I send out a parent's student notification that the project had been started and that any absent students needed to contact their classmates to establish groups before Monday morning. This was important, as you'll see. I'm sure you can guess what happened next. Immediate fallout. The next Monday, the seniors came traipsing in seconds before the bell to discover that there are only two tables to sit at. Whatever, they take their seats. Me, after attendance. Okay, everybody has a copy of the rubric, so go ahead and get started. Rest of class immediately pulls out rubric. Seniors, looking around frantically. The seniors quickly realize that they have been played and the arguing starts. First thing that happens is that Larry, Curly, and Mo decide that they now belong with whoever they happen to be sitting with and scoot their chairs over to sit with different tables. I catch this right away and tell them that the groups are already at maximum size, four people per group. The other four seniors are already fighting with each other because they know that none of them will actually do any work. Larry, who thinks he's God's gift to everybody, tries to sweet talk me and his group into special privileges and allowing a group of five. Now, I see some of the other kids wavering and I know that Larry is putting pressure on them to argue his case. I designed this project for specifically four people and had a job for each one, but I extended a separate offer. I will let you join, but since there will be five of you, I expect double the work. Literally, I told them they would have to do the project twice. Larry tries to argue, but I point out the roles I have established and inform him that if four people could do it once, having five should make it easier to do it twice. Sounds like a jerk move on my part, but I have now intimidated the other kids into saying, heck no, and even have them put it to a vote. Unsurprisingly, Larry is the only one who votes that this is a good idea, and when the other kids catch wind of my offer, they physically shoo off the other seniors trying to pull this deal as well. You will all be delighted to hear that the rest of my period for my seniors is spent arguing over who will work with who. 
They end up forming three groups and I nod my head, make sure they have the rubric, and then wish them the best of luck. Being the smart teacher that I am, I email Curly's parents and Mo's mommy that they have chosen to work with each other. Mo's mommy shows up to argue with me all the time, but has quickly learned I won't take her crap. At a previous meeting, she even laid into Mo and told him, I'm tired of fighting all these battles with your teachers, and I'm starting to think that you're the problem, but I suspect this is for show. Curly's parents email me back and say they will make sure Curly writes a group contract. You see, Curly has sold himself as the best student ever, and clearly he will do the work and fire his classmates. Mo's mommy immediately requests a meeting with me. Per school policy, I do not have to respond to an email for 48 hours. I wait until hour 47 and email a non-committal, I would love to meet, when are you available, and wait for a response. I then wait another 48 hours to inform her of a time the following week that works for me. Now, some of the other senior parents have emailed me angrily, demanding why I let their kids choose to work with the bad kids again. I had to inform them that I didn't expect all of them to be absent. Immediately, some of my seniors get burned at home because they ditched and their parents tell me, just try to help them pass, which I agree to. Some of them need this class for graduation, after all. Mo's mommy, on the other hand, shows up ready to wage war. She starts by demanding that I put Mo in a different group. I decline because the project has now been going on for a week and it wouldn't be fair. She demands that I add him to another group. They're all full and students have already done the lion's share of the work. She demands that I let him work by himself with an extension. I gladly offer him an extension and slide a copy of the rubric over to him and he goes white. At this point, he knows that he is never planning to do any of the work. In fact, I know that his group hasn't even started. I have a copy of their group contract which was hastily scribbled in pencil with no due dates on it. He starts arguing with his mom that he would rather work with his friends and that he is upset that he got stuck in this situation. Contemplating this, she accuses me of deliberately waiting until that day to do over the seniors. After all, it was a school sanctioned event and I'm being a jerk about it and she'll go to the board with her story. Wrong. The joy I get from all my prep work is shutting down BS like this. All seven of the seniors hung out on ditch day at her house and told her that the principal had given them the day off. Even better, they called in and pretended to be their own parents so that it was an excused absence. He is immediately busted and his mom flips her switch and jumps all over him. You see, she can keep pressing me on this issue, but I now have evidence that he pretended to be his own dad and this is a suspendable offense. I buy myself into her graces by telling her that I had no idea that senior ditch day was that Friday but I gave her kid a free extension on the homework that was due because I thought seniors deserved their own traditions, blah, blah, blah. She buys it. Also, I can prove that I emailed him and her and gave them plenty of notice before Monday morning that they needed to pick groups before something like this happened. Obviously, once I found out about Ditch Day, I tried to give her precious treasure a heads up, but I don't know why he didn't take it. She makes him open his email. My email is sitting there unopened and I have won this battle. She thanks me and takes him home. Class morale is super high unless you are one of the seniors. A week before the project is due, neither group has actually started and the HMS class average is about to hit an iceberg. The project comes due. It comes as no surprise that my enterprising seniors have turned in easily some of their worst work ever. One group got into a text argument the weekend before it was due and made one of the kids do all the work. Larry and Curly are in this group. The other group, with Mo have also turned into a steaming pile. I make sure to grade these two projects first because I know the fallout is going to be big. All the seniors dropped at least one letter grade, a couple dropped two. This is four weeks before graduation. Larry appears to take his F- in stride. They got something like a 10% on it, so I know he's plotting something. Curly's parents demand a meeting and so does Moe's mommy. Curly's parents are super upset that they got a bad grade and demanded to know why. What they didn't know was that I had already met with a student who did the entire project, poorly, and his parents. I informed Curly's parents that I had seen the text exchange between the seniors that pretty much ended up with, you do it. Curly refused to turn over his phone to his parents for confirmation. I also show them Curly's project and hand over the rubric. Mom and dad are not happy. You see, Curly has been blaming everyone else for his mistakes since the dawn of time and his parents have bought in completely, until today. Dad pointedly asks, what part did you do? And this causes Curly to spout actual tears. 
I then pull up a spreadsheet of all the group project scores from the year with no student data and have highlighted his scores, which are among the worst. The purpose of this was to use data to prove that their son, frankly, never does the work. Curly is absolutely destroyed by this. His parents kick him out of the conference because they are tired of his excuses and ask me what they can do. I tell them I would be happy to offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring and that he can still pass the class if he does his homework and gets a B on the next exam. They agree to this. We all shake hands and they leave. Curly's story largely ends here. He never shows up to tutoring and I email his parents. After three emails, his dad finally responds with, his mom and I have decided that he needs to learn to be an adult and are leaving him to his own devices. Thank you for your efforts. Curly will spend the rest of the semester doing little to no work. Because he is grounded at home, he is now just watching YouTube videos on his phone during school. The ripple effect is glorious because now Curly is doing this in all of his classes. I speak with his teachers and they all email that he has quit doing work in class and get the same reply I did rather than the vehement responses they are used to. When Curly fails his classes, he still graduates, but his parents have informed him that they are no longer paying for his college and it's time to get a job. Moe's mommy flips her crap and demands answers. Unfortunately, Moe is in the same group as Curly and she gets the same answers from me. Strangely enough, once she's exhausted every effort and attempt to somehow blame me for this, she admits that she knew Mo was part of bullying the lone senior and that he should be ashamed of himself. She deliberately tried to play me, but outed herself once she knew that I already knew everything. Super annoying, but I agree to help tutor him one-on-one, -on -one, which makes her happy. Long-term fallout. Mo's mommy is emailing me every few days now. Is my son doing his work? Did he get help with his homework? Etc non-stop, but she knows better than to fight with me. Larry is unusually chipper and is no longer doing his work. I find out that Larry is supposedly going to a college where he just needs to maintain his GPA over a super low number. He claims an F in my class won't change anything, so I make sure he doesn't distract the others. Mo shows up only occasionally, but strangely enough, Larry pops in just to say hi whenever Mo is getting help. I can't fathom why he does this, but suspect he is up to something and already have a backup plan in place. You see, Mo's mommy is nuts, and I make sure that there's always another person in the room with me when I tutor him. Anyway, Mo's mommy is constantly checking in. I start waiting 48 hours between emails, cause I can, and she starts dropping by in person unannounced to check on him. Me. She's been acting cagey lately, and I'm starting to suspect something. It's Larry. Larry is a friend of Moe's, so he's been in her home feeding her made-up stories to convince her that I have been a jerk to Moe when other students aren't around. Stuff like I was calling him names after school, etc. This starts a whole thing where she is now demanding answers from Admin, but Mr. Fighter Jet is smart. Admin asks me about details regarding my interactions with Moe, and I end up sitting down with my principal, Moe, and Moe's mommy. She details that Moe is struggling, might not graduate, and that she believes I have singled her kid out and wants his grade raised. You see, Mo is dumb and lazy, and his mom is just as bad. When Larry went to her with his story, she never bothered talking about it with her own son. She just agreed and went along with it. So I asked Mo point blank to please describe what has been said during our sessions and then offer to leave the room so that he can tell the principal without me there. She tells me to stay because she wants me to hear from Mo what I've done to him. What neither of them knew was that I was a mentor teacher. That meant I had a first year teacher as my mentee. Not a student teacher, but a new hire that works with a veteran teacher to learn the ropes of our school. And I had her working on grades and such in my room after school. You need so many contact hours. On the days I agreed to meet Mo. She was younger, so Mo thought she was another student and never questioned it and couldn't even remember that she was in there. My principal already had statements from her detailing my interactions with Mo and Mo was unable to give any actual details and suddenly forgot what had been said to him. This lands her in hot water with Admin, and she blames the whole thing on Larry and becomes visibly upset that she fell for such a stupid ruse. After that meeting, Larry is now suddenly super concerned about his grade. I rationalize that he was hoping to burn me out of my job and then use the fallout to get a free passing grade. Obviously, it didn't work. So, forget Larry. I have kids who actually want to succeed. My free days are now on days I know he works and he never shows up for tutoring anyway. Now that other teachers are hesitant to meet with him, he is unable to cut deals to raise those grades either. Seriously, teachers fell for his change of heart spiel every semester. 
Mo's mom makes a last ditch effort and tries to convince me that the parents of the seniors have scheduled a meeting with my boss to have me fired for giving their kids a bad grade and that she would be willing to put in a good word for me if I meet with her first. I'm sitting next to the principal when I get this email through an app on my cell phone and he has no idea what she's talking about. I tell her I'd be happy to meet everybody but that I would probably eat my lunch during such a meeting and that I hoped people didn't mind the smell of fish. I get a, no, seriously, they are threatening to sue you, but feigned stupidity and informed her that I couldn't be sued for eating fish during a meeting. She now realizes I give zero hoots about anything and can't be threatened. Again, there's nothing she can do because I'm simply following policy. The last few weeks are frantic for these seniors. One by one, they fall because they've done little to no work for a couple years now and they have no idea how to apply themselves. Other teachers are emboldened by how hard I shut them down and finally hold them accountable. A few of them just barely manage D's in my class, the rest fail. I get a few last second squeaks of, what can I do to raise my grade? But have now documented that none of them attempted the extra credit assignments and that was their chance. It's hard for a parent to crap on you when you can prove you actually tried to give their student extra credit and can then prove they never opened the assignment outline. These guys are now failing some of their other classes. A couple have breakdowns in my class and leave crying. Their friendships are fracturing with each other because they now all hate each other from what happened, which they will get over during the summertime. My last test came and I made it an online multiple choice test. It was easy enough to have the questions and answers shuffled in random order, meaning they couldn't cheat off each other. You see, I knew for a long time that they would sit next to each other to try and cheat on the exam, and Larry had blown a ton of money on a tutor to try and carry his friends. This throws them all off, and when Mo's mommy accuses me, again, of trying to trick her kid with a much harder test, it was easy enough to shoo her away with a simple email. Larry passes the exam, but his grade moves up to a meager D-. The results. If you're still here, congratulations on dealing with my wall of text. Here are the results. Of the seven seniors, one didn't graduate and had to transfer schools. His parents were embarrassed that they paid to fly the whole family out for a graduation that he didn't get to take part in. Two of the seniors lost all of their scholarships and could no longer attend the schools they wanted. Their fallback plan was to attend the same school together and become roommates, which they did with three of the other seniors, including Mo. I do have some after stories because I still work at this school and occasionally hear from the kids who graduated. Larry's college was not happy with his final GPA. I'm not sure what his long game was, but it sucked. The college kicked him out before he could even start and I found out his huge web of lies extended to his parents too. He toured Europe over the summer and tried to surprise his parents by coming home instead of going to school. Apparently, they kicked him out immediately after because they were selling their house to get a condo somewhere else. Remember, they travel for work all the time now so wanted to downgrade. Last I heard, he made up a story that he joined the military but got released due to a made-up illness. I say made up because I heard this tale from three different people and each one was given a different disease. Curly's parents relented and decided to pay for Curly to go to college after all. Curly got kicked out halfway through the year and they kicked him to the curb after living at home for a year and refusing to get a job. Last I heard, he works in a vape shop. Mo went to school and used his book smarts to try and pay other kids to do his work for him. His mommy is rich. When that failed, he faked his grades to get his mom to keep footing the bill. Eventually, the school kicked him out and he moved back home. The story his mommy told a friend of hers, who I ran into, was that he decided that he would rather be an entrepreneur rather than go to college and that he bought a drone to film weddings with. Last I heard, he was committing crimes. His mommy thinks he is working weddings. One senior went to college with his friends and immediately realized he needed to change. He quit hanging out with his friends and, last I heard, graduated with honors in a lucrative field. He emailed me once to thank me for challenging him in high school because it prepared him for college, so that was nice. That's it, the end. Thanks for reading. And if you ever had a teacher you loved, send them an email. We love hearing from our students. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.